Book 4. The Trial These murders are in the first degree, were premeditated, and occurred during burglaries and other crimes. We are asking for the death penalty. Prosecutor Phil Halpin in his opening statement to the jury. 33. By the time of the jury selection, the state of California had spent $1,301,836 on Richard Ramirez, and the case hadn't even gone to trial. There were editorials and news commentaries condemning a system that would let a murder case take so long to come to the bar and cost so much. It was an outrage, was the sentiment of many of L.A.'s citizens. Richard Ramirez had affected them in a very real, tangible way, and they wanted justice swiftly, not years after the fact. Jury selection finally began on July 21, 1988, from a pool of 1,600 citizens. The Hernandezes were looking for Hispanics and certain minorities. They felt that with a jury of all whites and Asians, Richard wouldn't have a chance. They believed Hispanics and blacks would have a more open mind. Richard now wore a shirt and tie and a black leather jacket Doreen had bought him. She, with the rest of the groupies, was in court every day, her heart and libido doing a flip every time he looked her way. Doreen felt that she and she alone was good for Richard. All the other girls were nothing but a bad influence on him and were a bunch of street sluts. Her love, she felt, was greater and more pure than any of theirs could ever be, and she would make sure Richard knew it. I loved him so intensely it hurt. All I would think about was him, day and night, night and day. I never thought of other men. I was a virgin, and Richard knew it, and that's why I was different. That's why he loved me, she later confided. On the first day of jury selection, fifty jurors were called. Thirty-nine were summarily excused, and the rest were questioned and grilled further. The Hernandezes knew that they had an uphill battle finding an impartial jury in L.A. County. They constantly complained to the press how biased everyone in L.A. was, and repeatedly made reference to a study they had done proving it. Richard felt the whole trial was a farce. If he hadn't been forced out of his cell, he would never have come to court. However, it gave him a chance to see his admirers and to stretch his legs. The juror selection was a slow, tedious process. It bored Richard, and he soon began falling asleep. He'd stay up late at night reading and would be tired for court. Judge Tynan didn't like his sleeping and warned him to stay awake. Richard took to wearing large black Porsche-type sunglasses, also bought by Doreen, so he could close his eyes behind them. Toward the end of July, Richard reportedly told a sheriff's deputy that he was going to have one of his girls sneak a gun into the courtroom, and he was going to shoot Halpin to death, then people in the audience, then himself. Security was already tight, but the bailiffs took Ramirez's alleged threat seriously, set up metal detectors, and searched everyone coming into the courtroom. On August 2nd, Halpin entered court in a huff, angry that he had been searched in front of 80 prospective jurors. I was forced to remove most of my clothing while standing in the hall, surrounded by jurors. It seems a strange approach to search the district attorney, but not prospective jurors, Your Honor. Judge Tynan apologized for Halpin's embarrassment. Daniel Hernandez told Judge Tynan that Richard didn't want to attend the jury selection. Tynan said that he had to, whether he wanted to or not. Midway through the jury selection, juror expert Joe Ellen Demetrius was brought in to help the defense. She had a long, thin face, intense dark eyes, and bouffant platinum hair. Richard often conferred with her. Jury selection took six months, longer than most had anticipated. On January 10, 1989, a jury and twelve alternates were sworn in, comprised of six Hispanics and six blacks, seven females and five males. The Hernandezes felt it was a victory for the defense. For most of the jury selection, Arturo Hernandez had stopped coming to court. Daniel had hired a paralegal named Richard Salinas, who had wavy black hair, a pointed hatchet face, and dark eyes. Daniel would often confer with Salinas on important issues. Arturo had apparently become disillusioned with defending Richard. There was no big movie or book deal, and the case was costing him money. A television movie about the Night Stalker was in the works, but the Hernandezes hadn't gotten a dime. As long as Richard refused to talk about his alleged crimes, nobody was willing to put up money. Daniel did his best, but the arduous task of being in court every day, staying in hotels away from his family in San Jose, and working without the benefit of co-counsel was taking its toll. He was tired, yet couldn't sleep at night. He'd toss and turn and worry about the case, his two little girls, and his wife. He began eating excessively, and by the time the jury was finally sworn in, 
he gained 25 pounds. On the morning of the first day of the trial, the courtroom was packed. Photographers lined the top row of the jury box, and reporters lined the benches tightly. The few seats in the courtroom not taken by press and lawyers held Richard's groupies, who had arrived early in the morning while it was still dark and waited in line, for the most part not talking to one another. Another of Richard's admirers, Diane Harella, had said to reporters earlier that day, The whole story hasn't come out. Richard is innocent. He's been framed, no matter what the prosecutor says. I know he's innocent. There was electricity in the air. When Richard was brought into court, everyone fell silent. He was dressed in a charcoal gray suit Doreen had gotten for him. The only sound was his leg irons as he hobbled to the defense table, wearing Porsche sunglasses. Reuben was outside in the hall, pacing back and forth, and blaming heavy metal music for his brother's problems. Maybe he'll save some souls if people learn the truth about that kind of music, he said. Judge Tynan welcomed the jury and alternates to the trial. He warned them that it would be a long and arduous affair, and suggested that if anyone on the jury was thinking of learning a new language or playing an instrument, now was the time. He also suggested exercise as a way to take their minds off the case while they were not in court. He read every charge to the jury, then turned the proceedings over to Phil Halpin, who introduced Alan Yokelson, William Merck, Frank Salerno, Paul Tippin, Leroy Orozco, and Gil Carrillo. Halpin made his opening statement in a matter-of-fact, dispassionate way, never raising his voice, never resorting to histrionics. With the help of enlarged maps and huge color-coded charts, he explained to the jury the series of crimes in chronological order, what connected them, and how he planned to prove it. He told the jury he would link Richard to the crimes with surviving witnesses, glove prints, fingerprints, and shoe prints at locations where he, Ramirez, had shot, stabbed, and beaten his victims to death while committing robberies in every case but Veronica Hughes. He made reference to the pentagram found at the Bell residence on the thigh of one of the victims. As Halpin systematically described the crimes, Richard made notes on a yellow legal pad. Whenever he moved his feet, you could hear the chains rattle. The attacks, Halpin said, stretched from Northridge to Sierra Madre in Orange County and were always near freeways for quick escape. Halpin told the jury about Felipe Solano, how he had much of the stolen property and would testify how he'd gotten it from Richard Ramirez, whom he knew as David Mena. That stolen property, mostly costume jewelry, had been recovered from the defendant's sister's home in El Paso, Texas. He spoke about the similar language used in different crimes and described Carol Kyle's attack, how she'd suddenly felt a gloved hand over her mouth and a gun to her head, and heard, Where's the money? Don't look at me, bitch. He told the jury that Ramirez had left a handcuff key on the mantel so Carol Kyle could free herself. That key is identical to the key that was discovered in the home of Ma Bell and Florence Lang. Of Mrs. Lang, Halpin said, She cannot speak, and she is fed through a tube, but she is still alive. Therefore the defendant is only charged with attempting to murder her. As Phil Halpin continued to describe the specifics of all fifteen attacks, for the first time made known to the public, there were audible gasps among the spectators, as well as the press and Richard's groupies. There were public defenders and ADAs in the courtroom who worked in the building, and even they, who dealt every day with the incredible savagery people perpetrated against one another, moved uneasily in their seats. Halpin told the jury about the luggage in the Greyhound bus terminal, saying items found in it, a nail clipper and a can of weight gain, had the defendant's fingerprints on them, and that there were twenty-five caliber cartridges with distinctive red marking in the primer. The experts looked at those cartridges, and by examining the still-live rounds, ascertained that they had been operated through the same twenty-five caliber auto that had been determined to have been used in the Aboeth murder and the Petersons' attempted murder. He said they'd be meeting Jerry Stubblefield, who had designed the Avia shoe with the distinct waffle pattern that showed up at seven of the crime scenes, the Cesara, Doy, Bell, Cannon, Bennett, Nelson, and Kuvananth residences. With that, the prosecutor wrapped up his opening statement and told the jury they'd first be meeting Jack Vinco, son of Mrs. Jenny Vinco. Jack now lived in Brooklyn, New York, where he'd been born and raised. Since the 1984 murder of his mother, he'd been turned off to Los Angeles. He had taken the loss of his mother very hard. The pain and feelings of loss, he felt, hurt as readily as if he had broken bones. He had turned to meditation. I chose for myself two simple words to meditate on calm and relaxed. Jack was now writing a book on meditation. Jack walked into the courtroom with a slow, shuffling step, 
a big man with a very sad face. All eyes followed him as Richard's chains rattled in the silence of the courtroom. Jack described for the jury the afternoon of June 27, 1984, how he entered his mother's apartment that hot June day, finding things thrown all over. He described how he found her, how he ran out of the apartment in a panic, yelling for help, and the police arriving, taking his mother's lifeless body away in a black plastic body bag. Halpin finished his direct and turned Vinco over to Daniel Hernandez. Questioning a witness at a preliminary hearing without a jury present was one thing, but questioning a witness like Jack Vinco with anything but respect was inviting the jury to dislike you. Hernandez's strategy was that the first crime on Halpin's list was a third-party defense, that is, someone other than Richard was the killer, and he was going to suggest Jack's brother, Manny, was that someone. The problem with this strategy was that Judge Tynan had already ruled the defense could not pursue that line of reasoning. Halpin had investigated Manny and learned he'd been in Brooklyn with witnesses to prove it. Daniel's plan to pursue this defense before the jury put him on a direct collision course with Halpin and Judge Tynan. He asked Vinco, Did you ever see, yourself, any type of behavior on your brother's part that appeared to be aggressive or violent toward your mother? Verbally abusive, but I corrected him. Nothing beyond verbally abusive that I saw personally. Never anything beyond verbally abusive, Vinco answered. But rumors you heard were beyond verbally abusive. Halpin's anger erupted. Standing, he said, Excuse me, Mr. Vinco. Let me object on two grounds, both hearsay and irrelevant. Sustained. Annoyed, Daniel asked for a sidebar, at which he described to the judge his third-party defense. Halpin told Judge Tynan about his certainty of Manny Vinco's whereabouts the night of the crime. Richard turned around and, with a deadpan, sunglass face, disdainfully looked at the press, snarling slightly as his supporters admired his profile and pined for his attention. When court resumed, Daniel took Jack through the day he had found his mother again. Most defense lawyers would have wanted Vinco quickly off the stand. It looked like he might cry at any second. Hernandez asked, How long were you in the in your mother's bedroom when you found the body? How long were you there before you ran out? Very brief. Seemed like seconds. And what are the injuries you saw? Hernandez wanted to know, opening the door for details which could only work against the defense. Vinco testified, the major injury, that there was a neck gash that looked like someone had attempted to remove her head and almost succeeded. Very serious neck injury. Hernandez interrupted. Non-responsive. I object and request that the latter portion be stricken. Overruled. Denied, Judge Tynan said. Hernandez then tried to suggest that Vinco had killed his mother because he had had a mental breakdown twenty years earlier. Halpin objected. Hernandez called for another sidebar, at which the judge slammed Daniel telling him he was being cruel, that there was no evidence indicating either Jack or his brother had anything to do with Jenny Vinco's murder, and that he was to stop implying they had. Daniel argued he should be allowed to impeach Vinco. The judge didn't agree and ordered his cross to continue. Daniel countered that Vinco had refused to take a lie detector test. Tynan said that that was irrelevant. Daniel continued to try to tie Jack Vinco and or his brother Manny to the murder. His effort proved futile and made the jury restless and uncomfortable. He hammered away at Jack, trying unsuccessfully to shed suspicion on him over Halpin's constant objections right up to the end of court that day. In the morning, Jack Vinco was recalled, and again Daniel Hernandez tried to link him to the murder and drilled Jack, clearly traumatized and suffering on all the details of June 28th, now implying he had killed his mother for money, as Halpin objected on grounds of relevance and was sustained. The jury began wondering what was going on. I felt so bad for that poor man, and here was Daniel Hernandez showing no respect at all, one juror would later say of Hernandez's cross of Jack Vinco. When Daniel asked Jack if it was he who'd handled his mother's financial affairs, Halpin strenuously objected, and another sidebar on the record was asked for by Hernandez. Judge Tynan refused to let Hernandez ask questions concerning Jenny Vinco's money matters, stating it wasn't relevant. The sidebar ended, and Hernandez repeatedly asked Vinco why he was frightened about talking to the police and taking a polygraph test. Mr. Vinco, Hernandez said, do you remember telling me that there was something frightening about the interview with the police? It was a poor choice of words, Vinco said. I should have, well, said concerned. That was just a poor choice of words at the moment. I meant concerned and said frightened. 
With help in objecting, Hernandez persisted until the judge ruled the questioning irrelevant. Daniel then tried to get Jack to admit he was relieved when he saw the time of death on the death certificate. Halpin again objected, and the objection sustained. Hernandez moved to a statement allegedly made by Wanda Doss, the owner of the building. Halpin objected, Tynan sustained, suggesting Hernandez make an offer of proof at the bench at another sidebar. What is the statement Wanda Doss was supposed to have made, Tynan asked. That she saw someone like him having breakfast, or someone saw somebody like him having breakfast, and that would have made him, that made him develop some type of fear, fright, reluctance to cooperate. That goes to his credibility, Hernandez said. Tynan said, I'm going to sustain the objection. It is hearsay. Back in front of the jury, Hernandez again asked about Wanda Doss. Halpin objected. The court sustained it. This would become a mantra, objection sustained, through the whole length of the trial. Halpin next put on the stand Jesse Castillo, the LAPD detective who had caught the Vinco homicide, and he told the jury how he'd arrived with his partner, Mike Wynn, secured the crime scene, and run the evidence gathering. Using photographs, Halpin helped bring Castillo and the jury back to that June day in 1984, five years earlier, and Castillo described the crime scene. Halpin asked, can you describe the trauma of Jenny Vinco that you discovered during your investigation? Sir, she had received many stab wounds to the upper chest area and some wounds to the hands. Halpin handed him a photograph. And finally, let me show People's Exhibit 1H and ask you to tell the jury what is depicted there. Sir, that is the lower part of her body, the end of her dress, and depicting some of the panty girdle that she was wearing at the time. All right. And specifically, with respect to that area of the body, did you notice any trauma? Some to the legs and to... The inside was torn out, the inside of the panty girdle, the inner crotch area was torn. Richard moved, his chains rattled. Spectators shifted uneasily in their seats, wondering why. Halpin finished and Hernandez stood and began his cross, taking Castillo through every step of what he did that day, which took much longer than Halpin's direct. Detective Castillo had, in fact, had some difficulty with Jack Vinco. How would you describe his, Jack Vinco's, demeanor in terms of his cooperation with you, Hernandez asked. Sir, he was difficult to interview. Can you tell me, can you describe his demeanor, what made it difficult? Well, it would depend on what day you are talking about. Sometimes he was very cooperative, and then he would turn hostile and be very uncooperative. Halpin didn't like that answer, but he could do nothing about it. Daniel proceeded to ask Castillo if his investigation of Vinco had moved out of state. Halpin objected on the grounds of relevance. Judge Tynan thought that it was a good note to recess for lunch, reminding the jurors and alternates not to talk about the case among themselves or with the media, reserving decision on Halpin's objection. Gill and Frank hurried back to the office and grabbed some sandwiches. Frank was still running Team 3, and there was a lot of work on his desk. He did what he could, and he and Gill hustled back to court. After lunch, and without the jury present, Judge Tynan took up Halpin's objections regarding Detective Castillo's going to New York State. When asked for a show of proof for that line of questioning, Hernandez withdrew the question. Halpin moved on to another matter. Hernandez's objections to his direct as being leading and his having been admonished in front of the jury. He complained to the judge that they gave the jury the impression he was doing something wrong when in fact he wasn't and said he didn't want the record to reflect any kind of improper questioning on his part. Tynan said he understood his concern, and promised not to admonish him about how he did his direct. He then ordered the jury brought in. Halpin was saving his ace for last. He was sure once Ronaldo Clara, the fingerprint expert, took the stand, he'd get a conviction on count one. Clara told the court he'd had ten years' experience and had conducted 4,000 crime scene investigations, including work on homicides and bank robberies. He described for the jury, at Halpin's patient, methodical prodding, how he dusted the window screen with magnetic powder and discovered five fingerprints, which he'd lifted with lifting tape and placed on a print card. There were, he stated, four prints on the screen and one on the window. Halpin took the print cards out of a sealed bag and showed them to Clara, and he identified them as the ones removed from the Vinco crime scene. He said he'd also found two more prints on the screen which were not identifiable at all. When Halpin asked if he had compared the latent prints with the ones on file, he said he hadn't, that a colleague, George Herrera, at the coordination desk, had done that. 
Halpin turned Clara over to Hernandez, who wanted to know if Clara had dusted anywhere else in the Vinco house for prints. He said he dusted the whole house. Anything that is printable by powder, I tried. The bathroom walls weren't porous enough for dusting, and the detectives decided to use ninhydrin in the morning, Clara said. Hernandez's questioning of Clara also took far longer than Halpin's direct. After nearly an hour, he finished, and Halpin asked a few questions on redirect about the exact place the four discernible prints had been found, whether they were on the inside or the outside of the screen, to which Clara said he couldn't tell. Almost as an afterthought, Hernandez reminded Clara that at the preliminary hearing he'd said that nobody could tell how long the prints had been there, a week or a few months or even a year. With that, Hernandez could later argue to the jury his client's prints could have been put there long before Jenny Vinco's murder. Richard felt that introducing the prints Clara had found was a travesty of justice. He'd later say, these fingerprints should not have been allowed in at all. They had only three discernible loops, and for a print to be admissible in court, it's supposed to have seven loops. Halpin then called John Herrera from the coroner's office, and he told the jury how he'd been called to the Chapman residence and was directed to a bedroom where he saw the deceased. He said he took her body temperature at 4.50 p.m. There was rigor mortis about the body and lividity on the back and neck area. There was the possibility that she had been sexually assaulted because her girdle was pulled down and her dress was partially lifted, Herrera testified. People in the courtroom cleared their throats and moved in their seats. As Richard crossed his feet, the chains rattled, and all eyes moved in perfect unison, like a school of small, nervous fish in his direction. Halpin had Herrera tell the jury what rigor mortis, lividity, and body temperature all meant. He knew there was going to be a lot of testimony about bodies, and the more the jury understood, the more they'd be able to evaluate and appreciate the evidence. He finished quickly with Herrera and handed him over to Hernandez, who again had Herrera tell the jury the rudiments of rigor mortis and lividity, and how they each had manifested on Jenny Vinco's body. It seemed he was trying to prove the time of death was closer to 9 a.m. or earlier, which he felt would tie Jack Vinco to the murder. Halpin repeatedly objected, and Tynan sustained it. In frustration, feeling the judge was conspiring to undermine his case, Hernandez finished with Herrera, and court was recessed for the day. Richard stood up, and tall and lanky walked loudly toward the door leading from the court. He never took off the sunglasses, and no one could tell where his eyes were. Doreen hoped they were on her. Every woman there hoped his eyes were on her. As he looked in the direction of the press, his lips twisted into a silent snarl filled with genuine disdain. Halpin's next witness, Dr. Joseph Cogan, from the morgue, was unable to be there that day. The prosecutor moved on to the next case and called Maria Hernandez, now married and pregnant with her first child. Halpin had her describe what had happened the evening she had been shot and her roommate killed. He showed her pictures of the garage and Dale's car, marked Exhibit 3C, and asked her if she recognized the ACDC baseball cap in the foreground of the photo. Maria said she didn't. Halpin knew he had witnesses who would put that hat on Richard Ramirez's head. He had her tell the jury step by step how she parked in the garage and heard a noise as she was entering her apartment. Her eyes were big and filled with the pain of the memory, and they never moved in Richard's direction. When Halpin asked what she saw after she turned around, she said, I saw a man pointing a gun. She described being shot and told the hushed courtroom the details of how her assailant went into the condominium and her then hearing a shot as she tried to flee. For a moment, she told the jury, she thought he was behind her and had shot at her again, but there was no one there. She ran around front and saw the same man walking away from her condo. He saw her and pointed the gun at her, then ran. Maria, testifying in a calm voice, told the jury how she found Dale dead on the floor. Dale's sister and other relatives were in the courtroom, and they began to cry. Now, Miss Hernandez, Halpin asked, do you see in the courtroom the man that shot you that night? Yes. And will you point him out to the jury, please? She raised the hand that she'd been shot in, pointed at Richard, and said, the man on the end is all eyes moved to Ramirez. The defendant, Richard Ramirez, for the record, Judge Tynan said. Maria was now Daniel Hernandez's witness. He complained that she was out of sequence and he needed until one thirty to review and prepare, perhaps move things along faster than to start right away and not be as prepared as I should be for the specific witness. Halpin objected. 
Council knew she was going to be here for a couple of years now. The same thing happened at the preliminary hearing. We were out of sequence frequently, so we both had to be prepared. Judge Tynan told Hernandez to do the best he could, but Daniel repeated that he wasn't ready, saying the district attorney was switching witnesses and trying to confuse the defense. At a sidebar, Halpin told Judge Tynan to stop Hernandez from insulting him in front of the jury. Tynan agreed and told Daniel that as a trial lawyer, he should be prepared. He ordered him to continue. Hernandez took Maria through every aspect of her assault without regard for the trauma she had gone through on the night of March 17th, often asking what appeared to some to be impertinent or nonsensical questions. He seemed, however, to make some headway when he asked her to describe her assailant. She said, From what I can remember at this point, it is very fuzzy. I can tell you he was 5'10", something like that, at least as far as, as far as I know. I didn't have a tape measure with me. Dark clothes, dark hair. That's all I really can remember. It had happened four years before, and much of that whole evening was blocked and hazy. She answered, I don't remember, to many of Hernandez's subsequent questions. Do you recall seeing any details of the person's face, the person's physical qualities, or anything, Hernandez asked. I remember testifying that I did, but my memory now, I don't have a clear picture. Today, here today, you can't tell me that you remember seeing your attacker's face? No. So, when you pointed out Mr. Ramirez today, you were relying on some other time in terms of what you said then. I was relying on my testimony then. So, in your memory today, you can't really point at Mr. Ramirez and say that is the person. Everyone in the courtroom, it seemed, all at once, leaned forward to hear her answer, for she spoke softly now. Not truthfully, not definitely, she said. A hushed exclamation of surprise rose and fell. As much as Gill, Frank, and Halpin didn't like the answer, Hernandez liked it fine. If that didn't lay the groundwork for reasonable doubt, nothing did. Daniel wanted to weaken the case even more, but his tactics caused Maria to seem more traumatized and vulnerable. At noon, Tynan broke for lunch, and a shaken Maria Hernandez stepped down from the stand. Richard didn't take his eyes off her as he grinned broadly. He felt that Satan had interceded and forced her to tell the truth. That she really couldn't recognize me. She saw me in the news and in the papers. That's why she ID'd me at the lineup. Her description to the police didn't look anything like me. Maria hated being near Ramirez while she was pregnant. She believed in her heart that he was evil from his shoes to the top of his head, and not someone to be around when you were pregnant. At one thirty, Hernandez resumed the cross-examination, confident he could further show the jury that Maria Hernandez wasn't sure Richard was her assailant. He tried to get her to concede that she'd used her purse to protect herself, and in doing had never even seen who shot her. But Maria was firm and sure when she told him the purse had not blocked her view. Halpin stood ramrod straight, absolutely determined to repair his case on direct. He had her detail the injury to her right hand, wanting to dispel any notion that her pocketbook had shielded her view. He then had Maria describe for the jury exactly what had happened at the lineup. On September 5th of 1985, when you identified the defendant as the person who shot you, were you positive of your identification? Yes, she said. Daniel Hernandez objected, calling it hearsay, and Tynan ruled against him. Maria didn't remember if she had identified Ramirez at the preliminary hearing, but at an April 9 motion in front of Judge Tynan, she had recognized him as the man in black who'd shot her. Halpin conferred with Yokelson, then asked the court to let her read her testimony at the preliminary, to which Hernandez objected vehemently. There was now a question about her identification, Tynan said, and the people had the right to set the record straight. Maria silently read her testimony. And do you recall now if you identify the defendant as the man that shot you? the prosecutor asked. Yes, I did. Halpin questioned Maria on her recollection of how clear her memory was at her previous appearances in court and at the lineup, and she was confident that her memory of her attacker's appearance was fresh in her mind at those times. It appeared Halpin had repaired the damage of Maria's memory lapse. Daniel Hernandez, though, was determined to take back the advantage. He questioned her again about her identification, but Maria held fast, and he couldn't dissuade her in the slightest. He suggested Gil Carrillo had told her Richard was number two in the lineup, which she denied. He went over the same thing again and again, getting the same answer and losing the attention of the jury. When Daniel finally sat down, a collective sigh of relief went throughout the courtroom. 
Halpin said he had no more questions. He wanted Maria to be able to get off the stand. He felt terrible that she'd been subjected to Daniel Hernandez's cross, but he couldn't do anything about it, and he apologized to her with his eyes. Judge Tynan told her she was excused and was subject to recall. He recessed court until 3.15. At the defense table, Daniel felt triumphant. He was sure he had invalidated Maria's testimony by showing the jury she really didn't remember anything about the events of May 17. Richard wasn't so sure. Joseph Kogan, the pathologist who'd done the autopsies on both Jenny Vinko and Dale Okazaki, was called. He testified that Vinko's stab wounds were arbitrarily numbered from head to toe. Four occurred in the trunk, six in the neck area. He described in detail the injury each knife wound had caused. Any one of the wounds would be fatal, he summed up. It was clear to everyone in the court that Jenny's killer had known exactly what he was doing. Dr. Kogan testified that the neck wounds were peculiar because they were stab wounds incorporated with slash wounds and went from ear to ear. And these stab wounds were, were driven in. One of them hit the spine and produced a small fracture in the spine, and then across the two stab wounds on either side of the neck was this, the slash wound, and the slash wound severed the trachea almost entirely, the trachea being the air tube which supplies air to the body and lungs, and it severed one of the deeper veins in the neck. There was evidence of blood aspiration into the lungs, indicating that the slash wound to the neck occurred while she was alive, and that she had breathed blood into the lungs. The eerie silence in the courtroom was tangible as the reality of the stalker's work invaded people's minds. A few of the press members subconsciously reached for their own throats. One of Richard's groupies later admitted she became sexually excited by the description of all the blood. Halpin asked the doctor if he'd found any hilt marks. Kogan said yes and explained that if a knife is driven into the body with force, black and blue marks form around the wound. He estimated that Jenny Vinko might have been alive for a few minutes after the wounds were inflicted. Judge Tynan interrupted, saying it was close to 4 p.m. and they should call it a day. The reporters hurried into the hall to try for quotes from the key players for the evening news. Doreen and a few of Richard's other admirers hurried over to the jail so they could visit with him. Halpin wanted to start with the neck wounds and show the jury close-up color shots of the slash across Jenny's throat taken during the autopsy. Hernandez objected heatedly, saying the photographs were inflammatory and the jury should not see them. Halpin countered that the wounds were virtually identical to injuries at other murder scenes and evidence in themselves. Judge Tynan was very reluctant about showing these photographs to the jury. They were horrible and would inevitably cause emotional turmoil and nightmares. He told Halpin that if he could show him that the wounds that were identical, he'd consider it. Otherwise, only diagrams and drawings, which Hernandez had suggested, would be allowed. Halpin said he would need some time to go through all of the photos. Halpin said he had photographs with the same slash wounds from Incident No. 4, Maxine Zazera, Incident No. 8, Mary Cannon, and Incident No. 12, Max and Leela Knighting. Alan Jokelson was sent to get them. Tynan would delay his ruling on the admissibility of the photographs until he had seen them all. In the meantime, Halpin would resume his direct examination of Kogan. James Wegner had done the actual autopsy on Dale Okazaki, but he'd left the medical examiner's office and wasn't available. Halpin intended to use Kogan to establish the facts. Hernandez objected on grounds of hearsay, but Tyson allowed it after much arguing, based on its being an official business record. Allowed to read Dr. Wegner's report, Kogan told the jury the exact cause of Dale's death. A gunshot wound to the middle right forehead had caused massive hemorrhaging and hemorrhagic brain damage. He testified there was a second injury, blunt force trauma that had probably been sustained when Dale went down after being shot. Kogan said there was stippling, gunpowder marks, on Dale's forehead, indicating she'd been shot at relatively close range. The distance from the front of the barrel is about 18 inches. It varies from firearm to firearm depending on various factors, the type of weapon, ammunition, etc. Halpin handed the doctor a bullet envelope, from the medical examiner's office, containing the small, slightly dented twenty two caliber projectile, which, according to the report, was the actual slug Wegner had removed from Dale's head. Halpin had the doctor examine how an autopsy was done and how such a projectile would actually be removed. Then they broke for lunch. When court resumed, Hernandez's first question was, Doctor, 
As far as the wounds that you described to the body of Jenny Vinko, can you tell me which of these wounds would be immediately fatal? None are such that they would be immediately lethal. The wounds to the neck, I would say, would be more immediately lethal than the wounds to the abdomen. For nearly an hour and a half, Daniel asked questions about the wounds and how long a person would actually live after receiving such injuries. Richard fell asleep behind his sunglasses. It became a meandering, repetitive cross that went around in circles. One court observer likened it to a dog chasing its own tail. Halpin asked a few questions regarding Jenny's time of death. He did not want the jury confused on that fact. The doctor reiterated that based on the liver temperature, she died somewhere between 1,200 and 1,600 hours, noon and 4 p.m. on June 28th. Daniel's recross questions concerned rigor mortis in time of death. He was obsessed, it seemed, with getting Dr. Cogan to concede facts he was intent on not conceding, and this went on for another full hour as Richard slept. Jurors moved about in their seats, and the journalist wished his testimony would come to an end. When he was finally finished, the prosecutor had no further redirect, and Judge Tynan dismissed him. He stepped down from the stand, glad to be away from Daniel Hernandez and his questions. After a brief recess, Gil Carrillo was called as the next witness. His huge presence, a regular part of court proceedings since the start of the trial, he mounted the witness stand and told the jury about the Sunday night he'd received the call at home, directing him to the Hernandez Okazaki residence in the city of Rosemead, only a ten-minute drive from where he lived. Using photographs Halpin showed him, Gill told the jury where he walked and what he did upon his arrival. Halpin had him describe everything he'd seen at the crime scene and how he'd gone to the Beverly Hospital the next day to interview Maria. Halpin moved to Gill's relationship with Maria Hernandez's family and had him explain to the jury how her mom had been good friends with his sister on the block where he'd grown up. Halpin had him recount for the jury the incident in which Maria's mother had come to the house that night to collect some personal things for her daughter. Gill testified he'd attended Dale's autopsy and had watched the twenty-two caliber slug being removed from her brain as her sister in the audience let out a small plaintive wail. He identified the slug for Halpin. Halpin moved to the September 5th lineup. He didn't want any confusion about Gill's influence over Maria regarding her picking Richard out of the lineup. Gill testified he'd never shown Maria Hernandez any pictures of Richard Ramirez. Halpin asked if Gill had communicated at any other time with Maria. Gill told the jury he'd met her at the house after she'd been released from the hospital and had her take him through every step of what had happened that night. Halpin tried to establish for the jury that Maria had had ample light to see her attacker clearly. The bulb, Gill testified, was part of the door closer and was in the center of the garage, hanging from the ceiling. Judge Tynan suggested they resume Monday morning at 10.30. Gill was just warming up and wanted to continue, wanted to get it over with but he had no say in the matter. 34. Richard hated weekends in the Los Angeles County Jail. On the outside, Saturdays and Sundays were always favorite days of his, and when weekends rolled around, the loss of his freedom seemed compounded. Richard had always been the kind of person who was always on the move. Ever since he was able to walk, he'd never been able to sit still. That was one of the reasons he was so uncomfortable in school. Sitting still for hours on end had been very difficult for him. My brother, Ruth said, never stayed in one place too long. I mean, it was like he had jumping beans inside him. He was always active, going somewhere or coming back from somewhere. Now he could go nowhere. He lived in a six-by-eight-foot steel cubicle and probably would for the remainder of his life. Richard, however, continued to escape from the jail with books, and whatever he read picked him up and transported him to where the story took place. No matter what they do to me, my mind is free and it can go where it wants to go, and they can't do anything about it, he'd later say. An admirer of Richard's had sent him a story about Jack the Ripper and his grisly deeds, and that weekend Richard was, through the book, transported to Whitechapel in London, where he walked the cobblestone byways as fog swirled around his feet. Letters were also a way for him to find relief from the flat steel walls and guards' hostile, curious stares. He would later relate that whenever a new sheriff's deputy hit high power, he inevitably would come and take a look at Richard, at the fear-inspiring Night Stalker. To the guards, all convinced he was indeed the killer, Richard was the personification of the bad guy, the epitome of evil, as dangerous as a man-eating shark. Most of them wouldn't say anything, they'd just look at him with curiosity and apprehension. 
Richard didn't like people coming around and bothering him, staring at him. For the most part, he had very little contact with other inmates. Even when he received visits, the guards wouldn't bring him to the visiting area when other inmates were still there. Richard took to putting crime scene photographs on the walls of his cell, using soap and toothpaste as glue. He'd gotten the photographs, which were part of the discovery, from Daniel Hernandez. Sometimes an inmate mopping the floor or pushing a tray of books would pass by Richard's cell and call him names, curse him out. Richard would point to the photographs and say, There's blood behind the stalker, and the inmate would inevitably look once and go away pale. One of the photographs was of Maxine Cesara. The guards saw the photograph, but Richard was legally allowed to have it as part of his defense, and the guards could do nothing. Doreen, as well as a few of Richard's other admirers, came to see him that weekend. She wanted to be sure she wouldn't be shut out of a visit, because other women had gotten there before she did, and she was there at five in the morning, standing in the dark, leaning against the gray concrete wall of the jail. She had become as obsessed with Richard as a holy man is with his lord. He was her sunrise and her sunset, the moon and the stars. She thought of nothing but Richard. She was sure she could help him with the purity and sincerity of her love. Doreen wanted to marry him, to have his children and serve him breakfast in bed in the morning. She fervently hoped he'd win the trial and be freed so they could escape somewhere together. But with everyone lying about her true love and with all the unfair press, she knew his chances for acquittal were not good. Whatever Richard wanted, Doreen secured for him. He was the boss in their relationship. She made sure Richard had money in his commissary account at the jail and sent him books and magazines, writing paper and stamps. She wrote him religiously every day and often sent him funny cards. Richard was like no one she'd ever known. She'd come from a quiet, conservative background had never been in any trouble and was always more interested in studying for school and in romance novels than in men. With Richard, everything changed. He was the ultimate rebel. Combined with his dangerous Latin good looks, he turned Doreen on in a way no other man ever could, she says. Doreen planned to give her virginity to Richard. She knew, however, that might never happen. She would sacrifice everything for Richard. That's what real love is about, giving, says Doreen. Isn't it? When she did finally see him, after waiting several hours, she could have only twenty minutes with him, and they talked about how well Daniel had done with getting Maria Hernandez to admit she couldn't identify Richard in the courtroom. Richard wanted to write a letter to Ted Bundy on Florida's death row, and he asked Doreen to get Bundy's prison number and address. He had, he said, some things he wanted to ask Ted about. Doreen was very good at locating information, having done it for her job at magazines. If Richard asked for something... Neither storm nor rain nor sleet nor flood would stop her from getting it. If he wanted Bundy's address, she'd find it. I'd cut off my right arm for him, she'd later say. Monday morning, Gil was back on the stand. Phil Halpin, fresh from the weekend and anxious to get into it, asked Gil if Maria had described her assailant when he and his partner had gone to visit her at Mercy Hospital. Gil testified, she had said, a light-skinned Caucasian or Mexican, 5'9 to 6'1", 19 to 25 years of age, with dark hair, wearing a black members-only type jacket, and also with a thin build. Halpin ended his direct examination. Hernandez began with the ACDC baseball cap, wanting to know if Maria had said her assailant had had a hat on. Gil said Maria hadn't said anything about a hat until he'd asked her if the ACDC baseball cap was hers or Dale's. Gil assumed that it had belonged to the assailant. Daniel asked questions for an hour without eliciting anything that could help the defense, and he sat down, seeming tired and sluggish. I have nothing further, Halpin said, in a hurry to put another witness on the stand and move the trial along. He made another motion to start showing the jury exhibits, particularly the photographs. Tynan asked for the prosecutor's argument to be made when they came back from lunch at 1.30. Court then resumed with the introduction into evidence of photographs that depicted Dale Okazaki lying on the kitchen floor in a pool of blood, her face obscenely swollen. Hernandez objected on the grounds that the photographs were excessively inflammatory and should not be shown to the jury under Statute 352. Judge Tynan said, I think under 352 I will permit the photographs into evidence. It is not a pleasant picture, but it is not unduly gruesome and does depict the wound causing death and the appearance of the victim in the case, so the objection will be noted for the record. Daniel voiced more objections about the evidence. 
Halpin moved to introduce photographs of the ACDC cap found in the garage, but Hernandez again objected, saying the hat was on a brown-colored mannequin, connoting a Latino, which Hernandez reasoned was unduly suggestive. Halpin said, I don't understand the objection to the mannequin being Latin. I didn't notice any particular ethnicity of the mannequin. Judge Tynan said, All I see is from the middle of the nose down. I don't think that is a Latin face. Hernandez said, I'm not referring to a Latin face, Your Honor, and I realize that sometimes certain symbols are not adhered to or in any way given value, but some portions of the population do. It may have some type of suggestion to the jury. Tynan did not agree and allowed the photo of the brown mannequin into evidence. Halpin moved to introduce the actual ACDC cap into evidence, but Hernandez objected, saying the pictures were enough and there was no chain of evidence which proved that this hat was the hat Gill had seen on the floor. Tynan let it in. Hernandez made a motion to exclude the next two witnesses, Jorge Gallegos and Joseph Duenas, from testifying, citing statutes 402 and 352. Tynan said the matter had been litigated at the preliminary and he was going to allow their testimony. Daniel wanted the charts Halpin had put up outlining the crimes to be taken down, as they were overly suggestive. Halpin had no objection. They were removed and the photographs were put on a pinboard on wheels that faced the jury. June Wang, Veronica Yu's best friend, was called next. She was very nervous, as fragile and beautiful as a china doll as she sat in the witness stand. Wang was deathly afraid of Richard Ramirez. She felt he was in league with Satan and hated being in a room with him, breathing the same air. She answered Halpin's questions about Veronica Yu's last day of life and told the jury, always conscious of Richard's eyes on her, how they'd been together Saturday and Sunday. Halpin asked, And did she, sometime that night, leave your home to go to her home? Around eleven o'clock. And did you ever see her again? No, June testified, and tears that had been brimming in her eyes spilled over and ran down her face. Halpin finished quickly. Hernandez conferred with Salinas. June Wang was a sympathetic witness, and most defense attorneys would have left her alone. She'd only been put on the stand to establish that Veronica was alive and well when she left June's house that March night, four years earlier. Hernandez stood up and moved to the podium. He asked her to tell the jury everything she and Veronica had done that Saturday and Sunday. Hernandez wanted the jury to suspect Veronica Yu's boyfriend as the vicious killer. Halpin objected on the grounds of relevance, and Judge Tynan sustained the objection. Hernandez, flustered and angered by the block to his theory, demanded the sidebar. Reluctantly, Tynan agreed. To Daniel's defense of relevance, Tynan said, This woman is simply testifying the last time anyone saw her alive. That is all. This other thing, Veronica's boyfriend, is totally irrelevant to any issue that I can even take a wild guess at. Sustained. Hernandez finished up with a few simple questions. Halpin called Jorge Gallegos, who had been sitting in his uncle's truck with his girlfriend, Edith Alcaz, on North Alhambra the evening Veronica was gunned down. Interpreter Cynthia Parker would translate. Gallegos looked in Richard's direction as he took the stand, openly glaring at him as if to tell him and the world that he was not afraid. Gallegos told the jury how he was able to see the incident in the mirror of the truck and described seeing a man trying to pull Veronica from her yellow Chevy. As the man took off, he saw his profile clearly. When Halpin asked Gallegos if he saw in the courtroom the man who was trying to pull Veronica from the car, he looked at Richard, pointed and said, He's over there. His hair is just a little longer. Halpin now had Gallegos tell of his meeting with Monterey Park Detective Anthony Romero and his identification of a car the police had as the one used in the attack. The strain of the trial was showing on Daniel. There were dark circles under his eyes, his face appeared puffy and he moved slowly, as if he hadn't slept enough. Arturo hadn't been in court since the selection of the jury, and the workload was far too much for Daniel. What was the description you gave Detective Romero? he asked on cross. I told him that it was a man, more or less my height, five six or five eight, wavy hair. He seemed to be oriental in appearance. The description didn't match Richard, and it seemed Hernandez had scored a point. He conferred with Salinas and Richard. Hernandez asked if the man at the preliminary hearing looked different from the man he'd seen that night. Yes. The hair, the dress? Yes, the hair, the clothing, the glasses. So he doesn't look the same as he looked that night? No, he does not look the same, Gallego said, peering hard at Richard. 
Can he stand? he asked Judge Tynan. Would you like him to stand? the judge said. Yes, I would like to see his profile without glasses and also from behind. Richard turned to Hernandez and said, Fuck him, man, I'm not standing up. Hernandez addressed the judge, said, Your Honor, he has already made an ID. I think this is just... The judge interrupted with, Mr. Hernandez, are you making an issue of it? Mr. Ramirez, would you rise, please? Take your glasses off and face the clerk. No, Richard yelled, all puffed up with defiance, obviously ready to fight. The bailiffs moved in. Very well, thank you, Tynan said to avoid trouble. He had no doubt Richard would resist rather than stand and accommodate Gallegos. He noted for the record that Richard had refused to stand and decided to end court for the day. As Gallegos stepped down, Richard snarled at him and cursed him under his breath, calling him punk and rat. The bailiff removed Ramirez from the court. That night, on the television news, it was heavily reported how Richard had defied the court and yelled no to Judge Tynan's request, and the next day his latest defiance made all the newspapers. As people read about it over breakfast, they shuddered. Never had there been an accused serial killer showing so little remorse. The next morning, Hernandez resumed his cross-examination. He tried to get Gallegos to admit that he had not really gotten a good look at the killer, but had little luck. Gill noted that one of the alternate female jurors kept staring hungrily at Richard. She had big round eyes, a pug nose, very white skin, dark red shoulder-length hair, and bangs. He pointed her out to Frank, who said he'd already noticed. They both hoped if an alternate had to be called, it would not be this one. All it took for a mistrial was one holdout. Hernandez's cross went on and on. Judge Tynan was getting annoyed and the jury was antsy. The judge admonished Daniel and told him to move on. Hernandez respectfully told Judge Tynan that he didn't appreciate being admonished in front of the jury. Tynan said he'd take his protest under advisement, and court was recessed. Phil Halpin very rarely ate lunch. It seemed the case never gave him the time. It was all he thought about from morning till night. He viewed his work as a life-and-death struggle between good and evil, and he was determined to win. Both Frank and Gill saw how consumed Halpin was, and they were worried. They knew if he didn't get at least a little respite from it, his health would eventually suffer, but no matter how many times they asked him to join them for a drink, he was too busy. Phil Halpin was the consummate professional. He was the most prepared, thorough prosecutor I ever worked with, Frank would later say. During the trial, Richard had his lunch in a holding pen behind the court. Always by himself, still segregated from other prisoners, he had a bologna sandwich on stale white bread and heavily sugared tea. He hated bologna and he hated sugar tea, but there was only one item on the courthouse lunch menu. After lunch, Halpin wanted to put crime scene photos of the U incident on the board. One was a picture of Veronica with a tube forced into her mouth. Hernandez objected, saying it was unduly unpleasant and not necessary. Halpin said it was the clearest picture he had of her and that it was not in any way particularly prejudicial. He complained to Judge Tynan that Hernandez objected to everything, whether it was objectionable or not. Tynan allowed the photos to be pinned to the board facing the jury. Hernandez then tried to bar the next witness, Joseph Duenas, and requested a 402 hearing, based on Duenas's not being able to identify Richard at the preliminary hearing. Tynan denied the motion. Joseph Duenas had heard Veronica U screaming for help and had called the police. Halpin took him through the incident. Duena said he could not positively identify the man he'd seen that night. He had described the man to police as about 5'7 to 5'8, about 145, 150 pounds, light complexion, kind of long, shaggy hair, but I couldn't tell if his eyes were quite slanted or if they weren't. People in the courtroom tried to see Richard's eyes, but he was wearing his sunglasses and wasn't about to take them off. Halpin finished with Duenas, itching to keep the case moving. Hernandez stood and everyone dreaded another long cross-examination. He set out to show the jury that Gallegos and Duenas were liars, only out for the reward money, the limelight, some false sense of justice. Daniel had Duenas describe every minute aspect of everything he did, said, and saw. When Hernandez asked him if he'd heard any gunshots, he said no. Everyone knew Veronica had been shot twice before she'd gotten out of the car. Duenas testified he was put in a police car by himself when he said he'd seen the incident. At the police station, he'd told the detectives he could identify the killer if he saw him. Yet in court today, he couldn't positively identify Richard. 
Daniel wisely ended his cross on that note, and court was recessed until 3.15. Monterey Park officer Ron Endo was the next witness. He told how he'd been sent to Alhambra Street, what he'd found, and what he'd done. Hernandez had Officer Endo describe everything he saw and did again, questioning him as if he were part of some large conspiracy. The jury appeared to lose interest, yawning and fidgeting. One of them even fell asleep. The following morning, juror number four, Alfred Carrillo, couldn't make it to court because Route 5 was closed. Judge Tynan was forced to cancel the proceedings for the day and excuse the jury with his usual admonishments about their not discussing the case. Phil Halpin told the judge that he would like to introduce to the jury all the photographs from incidents already presented. He suggested they be put on the board and the jury allowed to look at them. He did not want the photographs in the jury room because they could cause dialogue and comments among the jurors. The judge suggested letting the jury pass the photographs among themselves in groups relevant to each crime for ten or fifteen minutes and then let them have them when their deliberations began. Halpin and Hernandez agreed, and court was adjourned. Halpin next put Dr. Richard Ten on the stand. He'd been working in the emergency room of Garfield Hospital on the morning of the U shooting. He testified that Veronica had been brought in by a medevac unit and that he'd checked her vital signs, pronounced her dead, and filled out a coroner's report, noting two gunshot wounds as the cause of death. As with previous witnesses, Hernandez had the doctor describe in detail the condition of the victim. Halpin summoned Dr. Susan Seltzer, and she testified she'd done an autopsy on Veronica at 10.30 a.m. on March 19th in the presence of Monterey Park Detective Anthony Romero. The cause of death was two gunshot wounds, and she briefly noted the injuries each had caused. Daniel Hernandez began his cross by asking, Can you tell me which nerves were damaged or severed completely? The question required Dr. Seltzer to describe the damage to Veronica in greater detail. He implied Veronica might have been bruised prior to being shot because there were some bruises on her legs. But the doctor said they'd probably happened during the time of the shooting. He asked if Veronica had any defensive wounds, to which the doctor said no. Daniel wanted the jury to believe Veronica had been killed by an estranged boyfriend in an argument that might have started earlier. Before he moved to the next incident, Halpin wanted the jury to see the crime scene pictures. With Frank and Gill's help, the photographs were distributed to the jurors. The jury comprised ordinary people leading everyday lives, and it was a very difficult thing for them to look at the bodies and not be disturbed. They'd been changed forever, a juror would say later, but they all knew the worst was yet to come. After lunch, Halpin told the court he wanted to show the jury crime scene pictures of the Zazara incident. Hernandez protested, saying the enlargements were enhanced by artificial lighting, were excessively brutal and would only inflame the jury, particularly the women. Halpin disagreed. The male had been shot in the head, which was consistent with other crimes yet to be presented, and the stab wounds Maxine had suffered were like others sustained in stalker attacks. Judge Tynan ruled. Under 352, after careful weighing of all relevant factors, the court will permit these to be shown to the jury during testimony, and they, I assume, will be attempted to be bidded by the people after a foundation has been laid. The door was now open for all the pictures of the bodies to reach the jury. Bruno Francisco Polo, Vincent Zazara's employee, who had discovered the crime, was next on the stand. He was nervous and cowed by the enormity of the proceedings. Patiently and professionally, Halpin had Polo tell the jury about how he'd discovered the tragedy on March 28th. He described finding the bodies, the police, the fire department, and a medevac arriving, then Peter Zazara with his wife and small baby arriving. Halpin asked for permission to approach the bench and told Tynan he was finished with Polo, but before he turned him over to Hernandez, he wanted it made crystal clear that he would not tolerate defense counsel asking about the time Vincent Venera had done in prison, his having guns in his house, nor his alleged underworld ties. Daniel said he had the right to ask such questions, but Tynan ruled that he didn't. With the Cesare murders, Daniel was hoping to show the jury that Vincent's own son had said his father had mob ties, and that he and Maxine had likely been killed in a mafia hit. Though he knew it was out of the scope of his cross-examination, unless Halpin brought it up first, he was still intent about getting Peter Cesare's statement to Russ Uloth out for the jury's consumption. After a short recess, court resumed and Hernandez began asking Polo questions about his relationship with Peter Zazara. 
Halpin objected to this line of questioning as irrelevant and immaterial, and Judge Tynan sustained the objection. Daniel had Polo take the jury again through a detailed account of the events leading up to his discovering of the Zazara murders. Halpin eventually objected, as the question seemed to become increasingly more irrelevant. The lawyers approached the bench, and Tynan instructed Hernandez to find a more relevant line of questioning. Daniel went back to the defense table and conferred with Salinas, then grilled Polo on how many bags of money he had left at the Zazaras, trying to taint the pizza parlor receipts with some sinister underworld connection. After only a few minutes, the judge interrupted Daniel's cross so Chris Olson, the court reporter who felt ill, could go home. He reminded everyone not to discuss the case and that the weekend would be for three days because court was dark on Monday. The next time they'd see each other again would be February 14th. Valentine's Day. 35. For the most part, Doreen was the only one of Richard's dozen or so regular admirers who was still there every day, all day. Doreen's job at the magazine allowed her to set her own hours. The other girls, as well as many of the journalists, were now there just for the morning sessions, but Doreen was there for both mornings and afternoons, always hoping Richard would turn around and acknowledge her. She felt Richard had come to trust her. He knew she was out there, protecting his rights, writing letters to newspapers denouncing his unfair treatment. Samantha wrote him letters detailing how she would love to have sex with him in a cemetery at night on a cold overturned tombstone covered with the blood of one of the Night Stalker's victims. Eva O. told him when she came to visit how she wanted to have sex with him in her coffin, which she slept in every night. It, the coffin, would be their love nest the place from which she guaranteed him she'd fulfilled his every fantasy in the name of Satan, in the name of evil. Laura Kendall, a former fashion model turned professional dominatrix in New York, wrote to Ramirez that she fantasized about having sex with him in his prison cell. With Richard, she said, I'd want to be submissive. You can't dominate a man like that. Of all the women who claimed they were in love with him, Richard felt Doreen was the most grounded, she was a college graduate who didn't smoke, drink, or curse. Doreen's idea of profanity was, gosh, golly, and oh my lord. She was still a virgin, and was certain that appealed to Richard most of all. He felt she was his. All the other women he knew had had sex already. Many of them had sexual fantasies involving Richard, blood, knives, whips, and all kinds of sadistic abnormalities. All the attention from so many women changed Richard. On the outside, in the real world, he never had intimate sexual relationships with women other than prostitutes. The last woman he had had any emotional intimacy with was Nancy, fourteen years before. He had never thought of himself as particularly desirable to women. He felt he was too skinny, and he was self-conscious about his teeth. He was shy to the point that he had become more comfortable with the demons and evil entities that dominated the spirit world than with people. He never cared how he dressed never combed his hair, and living as he did, on the move, personal hygiene wasn't one of his primary concerns. Yet now that his full-lipped, high-cheekboned face and his alleged deeds were one of the hottest news items in the country, Richard had become much sought after by females. That weekend he received scores of Valentine cards from women as far away as Israel, London, Germany, and Spain. All this adulation by so many females pumped up Richard's ego and aroused his sexuality. Some of the women who visited him would, upon his demand, when no one was looking, raise their dresses and discreetly show him their privates. Of all the cards and love letters he had gotten that weekend, none was, Doreen felt, as important to Richard as her own. I was, she'd later relate, the only one who truly cared. All the others were a bunch of freaks and weirdos who wanted to use Richard for their own aggrandizement and kicks. But I didn't want anything for myself. It was only what I could do for him, how I could help him. When asked about the crimes Richard was accused of and the dire consequences if he was convicted, she said with patient finality, None of that matters. I love him for who he is. You have to take the good with the bad when you're in love. Doreen waited for hours to see him that Saturday and Sunday. She wanted to look extra nice because of Valentine's Day, and she put bows in her long black hair and wore a flowered dress she knew Richard liked. When she saw him, she told him how much she loved him and how much she wished she could have a conjugal visit with him on Valentine's Day. 
They both knew that was not about to happen, so they did the next best thing. Tuesday, February 14th, court reconvened at 10.40 a.m., Judge Tynan announced that he had to go to a funeral the following day and court would be dark for the afternoon. Sheriff's homicide detective Russ Uloth then mounted the witness stand to tell the court he and his partner, J.D. Smith, had gotten to the Zazera home about noon and after finding the footprints in the flower garden at the rear of the house, called for photographers and criminologists. Using a series of photographs, Halpin and Uloth take the jury through the Zazera crime scene. Uloth identified the close-up of Mrs. Zazera with her pajama top pulled up to expose her breasts and wounds. Halpin asked the detective to describe the wounds he and John Lorca, from the morgue, had discovered. We noted that her eyes had been removed, that she had sustained a left gunshot wound to her temple. There were three large stab wounds to the left side of her neck and one on her cheek. He described the knife wounds in detail. The testimony had a visible effect on the jury. They were very attentive, leaning forward and listening, horrified at the viciousness of the assault. As sad and troubling as hearing about the Yokozaki U incidents were, those attacks had happened with a gun. Killing was simply an impersonal matter of pointing and pulling a trigger. But here, a knife had been used in unspeakable, nightmare-causing ways. Richard crossed his legs. The chains rattled. Doreen looked at the back of his head and wished she could hold him, stroke his hair, take him away from all this. The following morning, before Judge Tynan broke for lunch, Uloth told about the autopsies. Uloth, J.D. Smith, Frank, and Gill ate in a Chinese fast-food restaurant and discussed the effect Russ's testimony was having on the jury. Hearing details like he'd described about the Zazera incident was a very sobering experience and would, they all agreed, bring home to the jurors the true depth of the Night Stalker's horrible reality. After lunch, Uloth described the ransacking, the three bags of pizza receipts at the front door, and the pillow with the missing pillowcase, and identified the slugs removed at the autopsies. Hernandez questioned Uloth about the pry marks the killer had left on the entrance window. Daniel implied that the marks had been put there when the Zazera house had been robbed previously, and that this had been an inside job. Daniel moved on to the Avia footprints. Uloth said they'd found the prints on the side of the house, under Maxine's bedroom window, and on the container used to get into the house. Daniel wanted to know if Uloth had ever seen a pair of the Avia shoes, like the ones that had made those prints. He said he had, in a footlocker store at the Downey Mall. And during your investigation, did you ever find any similar shoes other than at the shoe store? I didn't. Hernandez pointed out for the jury that no such avia shoes had ever been found on Richard Ramirez. Judge Tynan interrupted so the court stenographer could have a break. During the break, some of the female jurors gave Valentine candies to the judge and to the defense and prosecution lawyers. Alternate juror Cynthia Hayden had baked a few cupcakes that said, I love you, and asked the bailiff to give one to Richard. When the court reconvened, Ramirez found it on the defense table, and when he was told one of the alternate jurors had asked it to be given to him, he picked it up and promptly ate it. Richard loved sweets, and this was a very welcome treat. Judge Tynan said, People versus Richard Ramirez, A771272. He is pleasant with counsel. The people are represented, the witness is on the stand, the jury and alternates are in the box. The record will reflect that the court and staff, and I believe counsel, have received valentines from the jury. I want to thank you very much. They are not to be construed as bribes or in any other way affecting the integrity of the people in this case. Daniel took Uloth back to the crime scene and questioned him about what he'd seen and what he'd done, but none of these questions helped Daniel's quest for reasonable doubt. Los Angeles County Sheriff's criminalist Steve Renteria, who had worked the Zazara crime scene, was sworn in. His job had been to make plaster casts of the avia shoe prints. He told the jury how first photographs were taken of the prints, then the plaster was poured onto the prints. Halpin handed Renteria a sealed brown paper bag. Inside were the actual casts he'd made that March day. The killer, it seemed, had large feet, as the casts seemed enormous. The juror's eyes automatically moved down to look at Richard's chained feet. When Phil Halpin finished with Renteria, it was 4 p.m. Daniel didn't look well. He was pale and sitting low in his seat. Your Honor, I was hoping to start fresh with this witness tomorrow, he said. 
Give it a shot, Mr. Hernandez. Are you able to at all? I'm somewhat exhausted. It has been really warm in here today. Well, I will expect you to move with alacrity then, tomorrow afternoon, Mr. Hernandez, the judge said, and court was adjourned. As the jury and the alternates stood to leave, Richard took off his sunglasses and locked eyes with Cynthia Hayden. It seemed like electricity was passing between them. She wasn't a juror yet, but he figured with Satan's help he could get her on the jury. He knew what he saw in her eyes, and he figured she would never convict him and send him to San Quentin to die if she became a juror. She had felt his eyes on her all day. She'd later say of them, They have an animal quality that makes you feel he's looking right through you. Gil, Frank, and Halpin had heard about the Valentine cupcake Cynthia had sent over to Richard. They also saw the way she and Richard had looked at one another as court ended. They only hoped she would never get picked if any alternates were needed. The chances were slim. There were eleven other alternates, and the present jury seemed healthy, well-adjusted, and running smoothly. When Doreen saw the Valentine cupcake, she immediately knew Cindy had been the one to send it over. All along she'd been watching how Cindy had been ogling and staring at Richard, and she didn't like it one bit. Cindy Hayden was not some weirdo Satanist or sexually deviant street trash. She was well-dressed and obviously intelligent, with good taste, looks, and breeding. Later that day, when Richard and Doreen shared their first valentine together, she told him that Cindy was in love with him and looked like she wanted to have sex with him right there in the courtroom with everyone watching. He laughed and said things like that only happened on television. You mark my words, Doreen said. When this trial is over, she's going to come looking for you. Richard let out a big laugh. As Doreen left the jail that day, a dark-eyed, dark-haired female college student was hanging around outside. She was carrying a sign that read, I love Richard. Richard refused to see her. She knew who Doreen was and was resentful of her and gave her dirty looks. If looks could kill, I would have keeled over right there at the jail, dead, Doreen would later say. At ten o'clock the following morning, Daniel Hernandez cross-examined criminalist Steve Renteria about the plaster casts he'd taken. Although Daniel could not change the facts, he seemed to feel if he asked the same questions long enough, the testimony would become beneficial to Richard. However, all it seemed to do was bore the jury. The jury knew there were two sets of prints, one the killer's, the other Vincent's, and no matter what Daniel did or said, he couldn't change that fact. Finally, Halpin had enough and objected. The judge sustained the objection, and Daniel finished with Renteria. Halpin was ready to play one of his trump cards. He told the court the coroner in the Doy assaults was not presently available, so he was going to move on to a burglary case in Monrovia that he was certain tied the avia shoe print to Richard Ramirez. He called Monrovia officer Tom Wright, who testified he'd responded on May 9, 1985, to a robbery call on Olive Street at the home of Clara Hodsall, now deceased, and had found evidence of a break-in. A patio chair had been propped up against the back of the house, and someone had removed a lower window, and going into the house had stepped into a kitchen sink and left a footprint there. When the intruder stepped down to the floor, he'd put his palm on the sink and left a latent impression, which Officer Wright had lifted with a fingerprint kit he kept in the trunk of his police car. As well as lifting the palm and fingerprints he found around the sink, he'd lifted the footprint right out of the sink using extra-long lifting tape and cards. He gave the lifts to Sergeant Christensen of the Sheriff's Department. Officer Wright stated he also found footprints in dirt on the north side of the house and made plaster casts of those prints, too. Halpin handed him a sealed brown paper bag containing the plaster casts of the avia prints, the same size as the ones he'd found at the Zazara residence. Hernandez knew he had to discredit this witness. The last thing he wanted was Richard's palm prints linked to the avia prints. However, Daniel's cross-examination was unable to weaken Wright's testimony. He was able to establish that Wright had not had any prior experience casting footprints at crime scenes. During Daniel's questioning, Wright mentioned that he had found a pillowcase on the floor of the den. It was not lost on the jury that a pillowcase had been taken from the Zazara residence and that Halpin had said missing pillowcases were a common theme throughout the stalker crimes. It was not a point Daniel had intended to make. Halpin's next witness was Monterey officer Mike Gorajewski. He told the jury how he'd been dispatched to the Doy residence a little after 5 a.m. on May 14th, 
and had found Lillian and a bloody Bill Doy on the floor being treated by paramedics. He described the ransacking and the sad emotional state of Lillian. Halpin, as he would consistently throughout the long trial, kept his direct examination short and to the point. Very little of what Gorodjewski had to say was in dispute, and Daniel quickly ended his cross of this witness. Judge Tynan said he had to go to a judge's luncheon in Pasadena and told everyone to take an extra long lunch break and return at 2 p.m. Richard was taken back to the court's holding pen, where he had the same sandwich and tea, lay down and fell asleep, dreaming he was on a planet in outer space, where he was a king on a throne with everyone bowing and scraping around him. There were alien creatures in the dream, tall monsters who called him master, with big muscles and pointed teeth lurking in shadows. There were shrunken heads atop pointed spears around the throne. He was rudely awakened for court. Helpin continued with his presentation of the Doy incident and put on the stand Monterey Park policeman Bill Reynolds, who had also responded to a call for help at the Doy residence. It was Officer Reynolds who had removed the bloody thumb cuffs from Lillian's hand. He identified a picture of Lillian Doy at the hospital with the cuffs still hanging from her hand, and then the cuffs themselves. They were still covered with blood. Some journalists and court observers wondered where the stalker had gotten the idea to use thumb cuffs. Gill remembered how he had thought the stalker was a Vietnam veteran, for the U.S. Army had used thumb cuffs on captured Viet Cong. Richard hadn't served a day in the service, and Gill would not learn about Richard's cousin Mike until after the trial. Daniel's cross-examination of Reynolds did not gain any ground in planting reasonable doubt in the jury's mind. Halpin called Monterey detective Paul Torres. He said the inside of the house looked like a hurricane had gone through it that there was a lot of blood on Bill Doy's bed and in the hall and den where he had crawled to call for help. Richard had his head in his hand, daydreaming about being back in El Paso, hunting out in the desert. How, he wondered, did I get from that happy, carefree place to this courtroom where everyone is so intent on killing me? Often he thought of getting up and just making for the exit, forcing the guards to shoot him. A bullet in the head, he figured, had to be better than what life had in store for him. He hated jail. He hated being told what to do. He hated the idea of the system he despised so much, dictating when he would die. With Satan's help, he would pick the time and place he died, not them. He mused as he watched Paul Torres and listened to the sadistic havoc the night stalker had brought to the home of Bill and Lillian Doy. He turned around. All the journalist's eyes moved to him. They hoped he'd cause some excitement. As soon as he turned, his girl sat at attention, smiled and winked and blew him quick, secretive kisses. Doreen nodded at him knowingly, as if she and he had secrets no one knew about. Because of his sunglasses, she could never tell if he was looking at her or at one of the other girls, who stuck out their chests and pouted their brightly colored lips suggestively. Even if he was looking at one of them, it didn't amount to anything. She was the only one who mattered. She was the only one he trusted. She was the only one he confided in. Sometimes he'd be able to make phone calls to her, and she'd tell him all the things she'd do for him to make him happy. She'd even play some of his favorite music in the background. Doreen was very optimistic about the trial, and she often talked about how they would go somewhere private after it was all over and live happily ever after. After Tory's direct, Halpin moved to put the Doy crime scene photographs into evidence, as well as the footprint casts, the thumb cuffs, and the bullets removed from Bill Doy. Daniel objected to everything and was overruled. Judge Tynan also allowed two photographs of Maxine Zazera in bed that Halpin felt were necessary to establish the eye gouging and the viciousness of the stab wounds. Tynan then addressed the jury, warning them beforehand that they were going to see unpleasant pictures. He instructed them that seeing the horrible wounds was not to influence them against the defendant. He said, you must not assume guilt simply because the photographs depict somebody who has been severely injured. Do you understand that? That is your rule as jurors. You are to be as neutral and objective as you possibly can be. Given the intensity and the intimacy of the attack, that was a very hard thing to do, and Richard knew it. He didn't like the jury seeing those pictures. He was restless in his chair and moving around, rattling the chains. As the jury was given the pictures of the brutalized Maxine, Halpin moved to enter the palm prints, the fingerprints, and the footprints collected at Clara Hadsall's house in Monrovia. Hernandez objected strenuously. Judge Tynan offered a sidebar to hear the nature of the objection, 
which was that the crime at the Hatsall home was uncharged, and as such its evidence should not be allowed in. Also, it was irrelevant no avia shoe had ever been tied to his client. Halpin reminded the court that he had never mentioned any crime happening there. All it did was put the avia on his feet, because the fingerprints and palm prints were his, Richard's. The judge allowed them to introduce the photographs, fingerprints, and shoe prints. Tynan told Daniel if he could cite cases which showed he would be wrong in allowing the Hadsall prints in, he'd be happy to reverse his ruling. As the jurors studied the pictures of Maxine, some winced, some paled, and a few prayed. They were given the plaster casts of the doy footprints and the Zazera shoe prints, and asked to handle them carefully as they passed the foot-sized casts among themselves. They could clearly see the prints were identical. After collecting all the exhibits, Judge Tynan called it a day and told the jury to enjoy another three-day weekend. Noticeably shaken and taking curious, angry looks at Richard, the jurors and alternates stood and left. Cynthia Hayden stared long and hard at Richard. When he turned around, Doreen was the only one still sitting there. It wasn't lost on the bailiffs that Doreen was present every day, and they kept a close eye on her. Though she looked innocent and had no police record, they were leery of any woman who was that obsessed with a man who was accused of cutting out a pair of human eyes for the fun of it. 36. When court resumed on February 21st, Judge Tynan announced that Daniel Hernandez was ill. He said he had spoken to him on the phone and that he was suffering from nervous exhaustion was under a doctor's care and should be all right in a few days. Therefore, he had decided to postpone the proceedings until Monday, February 27th, allowing a week for Daniel to recuperate. Salerno and Carrillo welcomed the break. They would use it to catch up on lost time with their families and other cases piling up on their desks. Halpin said he knew something like this would happen and was concerned about Hernandez having recurrent relapses he saw this move as a stall tactic Daniel would try to parley into a mistrial. The jurors welcomed the seven-day hiatus from court. It was an arduous, difficult task, sitting still all day, listening to horrible stories and viewing photos of murdered people. At 9 a.m. on February 27th, an obviously annoyed Judge Tynan took the bench. Paralegal Richard Salinas sat at the defense table with Richard. Is Mr. Hernandez coming into court this morning? the judge asked Salinas. Salinas said no. Tynan told Halpin to approach the bench and explained that he'd received a letter from Dr. Pace, the San Jose physician who was treating Hernandez for nervous exhaustion and elevated blood sugar and blood lipids. The judge said Dr. Pace had told him he was putting Daniel on a weight loss program and that he was seeing to it that Daniel received stress management counseling. Daniel was not fit for the arduous task of representing Richard Ramirez and would need one to four weeks of recovery. Selena said Daniel's secretary had called Alan Yokelson the week before to inform him of Daniel's condition. Halpin was unconvinced. He had heard that Daniel had used this tactic during trials before. He thought about all the time, three and a half years, and hard work that had gone into this trial, the difficult tasks of finding the jury and setting up all the witnesses, now he'd have to call the witnesses and reschedule everyone all over again. The judge was not going to accept at face value Daniel Hernandez's medical disability. He ruled that not only Daniel was to be in court for a hearing on his condition on Wednesday, March 1st, but Arturo as well. Arturo was still on record as representing Richard, and the judge wanted him in court. Halpin suggested he could draw up a subpoena and bring in Daniel's doctor as well. He said... I have been through this before with one of our local attorneys, and it turned out that he misunderstood his doctor and in fact was healthy enough to go forward with the case. Tynan agreed and said he'd supply Halpin with the doctor's address for the subpoena. Tynan told a bailiff to tell the jury to come back to court on Monday, March 6th, giving them another extended break. All the jurors were anxious to get the trial over with, to be finished with this nightmare of civic duty and get back to the comfort and regular duties of their lives, Tynan decided to bring the jury in so he could explain Daniel's illness and apologize for the delay. He was only too aware of the jurors' discomfort. He told them to remember to keep their oath and stay away from the media. It was widely reported in the press that Hernandez was holding up the trial, feigning illness, hoping to cause a mistrial. Ever since the avia shoe print had been tied to Richard's fingerprints, it became evident that Daniel would have a very tough time winning this case. Reporters began digging into his past with a diligence. 
that soon revealed facts that had not been known up until now. It was reported in the papers, for instance, how Daniel Hernandez had been fined twice for not showing up in Santa Clara County Courts. It was also reported that Daniel had been given a hard time by the state of California in getting his license to practice law after he had passed the bar. Daniel attributed this to the FBI having taken a dim view of his involvement with farm workers, his protesting the Vietnam War as an undergraduate at San Jose State, and staying in Havana for a few months as a guest of the Castro regime. On March 1, as ordered by Judge Tynan, both Daniel and Arturo were sitting at the defense table with Richard. Richard was angry because Daniel was slowing up the trial process. He, perhaps more than anyone in the courtroom, wanted to get the thing over with, even though he knew it would lead to the death penalty. In death, Richard still believed he would have a place of honor in the court of Satan, and death neither scared nor unsettled him. Judge Tynan read a letter from Daniel's physician detailing the symptoms he'd been suffering, the tests he'd undergone, and an estimate of four to six weeks for recovery. The judge told Daniel sincerely that he was concerned about his health, but after having a lengthy discussion with Daniel's physician, he did not find just cause to allow Daniel to miss any more court. Daniel made a long speech about how tired he had been since jury selection, how he was the only attorney working the case, and how it was all just too much for one person. He requested a few weeks' recuperation time and asked Judge Tynan to assign another lawyer to the case to assist him. Arturo declined comment. Halpin complained bitterly about having to keep rescheduling witnesses, some of whom had been terribly traumatized by vicious sexual assaults, and all these delays were further traumatizing and upsetting them. These people are getting disgusted, he boomed. Judge Tynan told Daniel that he knew death penalty cases were very stressful. Some of us have chest pains, some of us have belly aches, but the point is, we all suffer stress in these cases, even the court. And it is part and parcel of a death penalty case and we have to deal with them as best we can. The judge went on to say that he saw no good reason to delay the proceedings further and ordered both Hernandez's in court on March 6th, ready to proceed with the trial. Halpin remembered clearly how hard Arturo and Daniel had fought for the right to defend Richard. He'd known, when Judge Soper had ruled that Richard had the right to choose his own counsel, that it would come to haunt the proceedings, and quite possibly even cause a mistrial, meaning they'd have to do everything all over again. That possibility loomed over the court like a dark storm cloud sent by Satan himself to help Richard. Halpin had vowed not to try this case again. It was too much for any man to go through twice. He already had an ulcer and high blood pressure. Both Arturo and Daniel said they would obey the court's ruling. They knew Tynan would hold them in contempt and throw them in jail if they didn't comply. Monday morning, March 6th, Daniel showed up in court with a new strategy. He was now certain he could not handle Richard's defense properly, even with Arturo's help, and he turned to seasoned trial lawyer Ray Clark, a light-skinned black man with salt-and-pepper hair and mustache. Daniel had been talking to him about coming aboard the defense team since January, and Ray had joined the defense team after Judge Tynan had agreed to see he was paid the standard rate for a capital crime case, $100 per hour, by the state. Tynan knew it would cost the taxpayers a lot more if Ramirez had to be tried all over again. Before court, Tynan met Ray Clark for the first time in a closed meeting with Daniel and Arturo. The judge had researched Ray's background and knew he was a capable professional who had had experience with capital crime cases. He even had special training enabling him to be a member of the group of California attorneys who met the standards required for death penalty cases. To Tynan, Ray Clark was a ray of hope. His arrival meant that this trial would actually move on to completion. No matter what, Clark told Tynan, I'm in for the duration. Ray Clark had been in private practice, handling criminal cases almost exclusively since he'd passed the bar exam in December of 1973, the year he'd graduated from Southwestern School of Law. He was partners with his daughter, Dawn Blaylock, and Ephraim Clark, no relation. They would be handling the firm's cases while he was committed to the Ramirez trial. Judge Tynan shook his hand and welcomed him aboard. Back in open court, without the jury present, the judge announced for the record and for Phil Halpin's benefit that he had appointed Ray Clark to the defense team. Halpin knew Clark and his reputation and was very happy to see him sitting at the defense table. Now he believed the case would move along quickly. Richard had no say in the matter. 
He knew Daniel was in way over his head, and he welcomed someone who brought as much experience to the defense table as Clark. Richard knew Clark didn't know anything about the case, though. Clark's appointment raised grave appeal issues. It was a landmark 1976 case in which a conviction against Charles Manson follower Leslie Van Houten was overturned by the California Appellate Court when a new attorney was substituted in mid-trial after Van Houten's attorney had disappeared. The court held that even if the new lawyer pored over the transcripts of trial testimony, he had missed the opportunity to view each witness's demeanor as he testified. It is elementary that the right to counsel means the right to effective representation, the appellate court had said in the Van Houten case. In our opinion, an accused is denied effective representation if her trial attorney is unable to effectively argue the case. Not only had Ray Clark failed to see any of the witnesses testify, he still had not read the transcript. Tynan was in no mood, however, for more delays and didn't give Clark so much as an hour to read up on the case. He said, It is my understanding, Mr. Clark, that you will be co-counsel and there will be no delays in the case for you to get up to speed, that you will do the best you can on your own time to prepare yourself, and that this case will continue apace. Is that correct? Ray Clark answered, That's correct, Your Honor. Very well, sir. You are appointed and welcome. Tynan set up a hearing for March 24th to resolve a dispute the special master was having regarding the prosecution handing material over to the defense team scientist. The 24th was a Friday, and the hearing wouldn't waste any jury time, Judge Tynan said. Daniel complained about the district attorney's office not trusting the defense and making things difficult. Tynan wanted to know why these issues hadn't been already resolved. Daniel, with newfound vigor from his rest, his new diet and stress management counseling, and boosted by the presence of Clark and Arturo, said he'd tried to resolve them, but the prosecution wasn't cooperating. The defense table now looked like a formidable force, with Salinas, Clark, Daniel, and Arturo all sitting there looking attentive. Halpin countered by saying he'd been waiting to be contacted, and accusations went back and forth, until the judge put a stop to them and ruled the issues would be resolved at the hearing on the 24th. The jury was brought in. Halpin had pathologist Kogan tell the jury the details of Maxine Zazara's murder. He described three gunshot wounds, eight stab wounds, ligature marks around her neck, and the way the upper lids of both eyes had been cut away to facilitate removal of the eyes. He described the stab slash wounds in detail, as the jury squirmed and moved uneasily in their hard wooden chairs, trying to see past Richard Ramirez's sunglass facade of indifference as he rested his cheek on the palm of his huge right hand. At this point, Judge Tynan broke for lunch. At one thirty sharp, Dr. Kogan was back on the stand. Halpin showed him the bullets removed from Vincent and Maxine and had the doctor explain what damage each round had done and from where each had been extracted. Halpin turned Dr. Kogan over to Ray Clark. Although he had not yet read the trial transcript, Clark asked questions that were precise and to the point. He knew what he was doing, and that soon became obvious. There was little Clark could do to help the defense with Dr. Kogan, who had been put on the stand only to authenticate the autopsies for the court. Halpin put Linda Doy Flick on the stand. She told the jury she was an intern in family, marriage, and child counseling. Halpin asked her to describe her mother's condition. She said, Cognitive level thinking ability to process information is at about a two year old child level. In the last few years, she's shown signs of senility. Certain things she is very sharp about, and other things she can't respond to as well. She testified that she lived four blocks from where her parents had lived. She had visited them early in the evening before the morning of the incident. Her dad was healthy and watching television, and her mom was walking around the home. She'd received a phone call from the police at 5.20 a.m., directing her to Monterey Park Hospital, where her mother had been taken. She said her mother's face was swollen and black and blue, and she was disoriented. Linda told the jury that she had been trained at Casa Colina Hospital in Pomona to work with the cerebrally impaired and with stroke victims. With this background, she had developed a way of speaking with her mother. Halpin showed her photographs of Mrs. Doy in the hospital, which Linda described for the jury's benefit. Halpin moved to September 5th, when Linda went to the jail with her mother to view the property lineup seized at Felipe Solano's house and other places. And did you, on this occurrence, see some items there that you recognized as property of your parents? Numerous items, she said. She had identified an inexpensive coin purse, a VCR, a Cernel Betacord, 
a coin purse of her mother's, a makeup bag, Lillian Doy's wallet, an Olympic pin her father had bought her mother, her grandfather's pocket watch, and the Omega Constellation watch her father never took off. In fact, she testified, the jeweler used to complain to him about it because he kept saying that if he took the watch off when he went to bed, there wouldn't be so much lint on it and he wouldn't have to keep repairing it. When Halpin asked what was taken that wasn't there, she said a one-carat diamond wedding band set in gold which had belonged to her father. The prosecutor kept Linda on the stand for an hour and fifteen minutes. Daniel Hernandez stood up to cross-examine Linda, asking her questions about the items recovered, as though he didn't believe what she was saying. He asked her about a crime report she had helped her mother fill out, which contained a description that clearly did not sound like Richard. Halpin objected and asked for a bench conference, at which he said Daniel's questions were irrelevant unless he was trying to impeach the witness, which he was not. He said he was not putting Lillian Doy on the stand, so it didn't matter what she said about her attacker. Daniel said he might call Mrs. Doy because Linda had seemed to be able to communicate with her mother, despite her stroke, when they'd filled out the forms on the night of the attack. Tynan said he'd allow one question of Linda about her mother's description. Halpin still objected, but was overruled. Daniel retrieved a police questionnaire from the defense table and asked for permission to show it to Linda, which Tynan gave. She said she remembered that Detective Paul Torres had come to the house two weeks after the incident and helped her fill it out. Did you assist your mother's putting together a composite for the police? Daniel asked. She said she had, at the hospital and at the house two weeks later. Daniel conferred with Clark. The jury was getting restless. Doreen knew the truth about the discrepancy between Mrs. Doy's description and Richard's appearance, and she couldn't understand why Halpin was so afraid of the jury finding out. She started thinking about writing to some newspapers to point this out. Daniel announced he had no more questions. Linda Doy slowly stepped down from the stand. Richard did not look at her. Judge Tynan called a recess. Cynthia Hayden sat with her eyes cast down. Gil Carrillo watched Cynthia closely to see if she communicated with Richard in any way. If she did, he'd have her ass thrown off the jury. The Valentine incident did not sit well with Sheriff's homicide. You may call your next witness, Judge Tynan told Halpin after the break. We're starting into another incident, the matter of Mrs. Bell and Lang, that occurred between May 29th and June 1st, 1985, Halpin said, and received permission to approach the bench. Because of the unexpected hiatus, he was going to have to present witnesses out of order and wouldn't be ready with his first witness until tomorrow morning. Tynan said he understood. 37. Phil Halpin opened by reading into the record the list of 51 photographs he'd be using in the Bell Lang matter. Ray Clark asked if he could have a bench conference without the court reporter. Judge Tynan said the reporter had to be present. Clark asked for a copy of the list of photographs going into evidence because he couldn't write them all down fast enough. Halpin said he'd be happy to give the defense a copy as long as there was no complaint about the order of the items listed. You may have a different situation with Mr. Clark, Judge Tynan said. The prosecutor introduced Mike Bumcrop from Sheriff's Homicide, who would be sitting at the prosecution's table during the Bell Lang presentation. Sitting behind Mike were Carrillo and Salerno in their usual places, as well as half a dozen of the homicide detectives from different cities in L.A. County. Family members of Mrs. Lang and Bell were sitting in court on the side with the police and seemed terrified by Richard's devotees. Halpin called Carlos Valenzuela, the elderly gardener who had found the two sisters. Carlos needed an interpreter. He was a shy man who did not like talking about that day, but he knew it was his duty as a citizen and as a man. He, like most of the civilians who took the stand, did not look at Richard or even in his direction. Carlos was a deeply religious man, and he had heard about the pentagrams. He knew the hand of Satan had a prominent place in all this. Carlos described how he had seen the newspapers and mail piling up at the front door at the residence of Nettie Lang and Mabel Bell, and decided something might be amiss. He opened the door, calling their names to no avail. He found Nettie first, then Mabel, with the table the stalker had left on her chest still there. He removed it and saw the horrendous beating she had gotten and the pentagram on the bed, and hurried to neighbors to call the police. Clark stood for the cross-examination, asking Carlos how many papers were on the porch there. Carlos said four. Clark asked who he discovered first. Carlos said Nettie. 
Clark said he had no more questions of this witness. James Olds, the first Monrovia policeman on the case, was called next. He testified he had cordoned off the house and taken pictures of the wounds and the general areas where each woman had been found. He made certain to get clear shots of the pentagrams and of the hammer, still speckled with dry blood. When both sisters were removed to the hospital, Officer Olds went along so he could take more photographs of the injuries after they had been cleaned, he stated. He treated the assault like a murder because the wounds were so severe he knew death was probable, and he wanted all the evidence needed to convict. As he described the horrible injuries for the jury, the people in the courtroom began to move uneasily in their seats. Several of the female jurors began to cry, and their sniffling filled the silence between Officer Olds' terrible words. Halpin finished with Officer Olds, and Judge Tynan called a lunch recess, knowing the jurors would need a break after listening to the wanton brutality upon two defenseless old women. The jury and alternate stood and left. Richard sat there silently, alone with his thoughts. It was as though he was still a boy in school having an epileptic attack. He would just zone out and not be there at all. Halpin's next witness would be out of order. He called Dr. Claire Paul Naby, a general surgeon, who had worked on Nettie Lang in Methodist Hospital in Arcadia, then Dr. Michael Agron, who had worked on Mabel Bell. Claire told the court she had done an examination on Mrs. Lang's genitalia and found two stretch marks. Appropriate smears and washing had been taken, and no usable secretions, that is, seminal fluid, had been found at that time. The injuries were very likely caused by sudden and violent stretching of tissue in that area, she testified, but she could not say how such injuries had occurred. Halpin had her read her preliminary testimony, then asked if she now concurred with what she had said then. Reading my testimony from that date, it was my opinion that some attempt had been made at entry to the vaginal orifice. That's what Halpin wanted the jury to hear, that 84-year-old Nettie Lang, probably bound and already beaten, had been raped. The thick silence in the courtroom was broken only when Richard moved and the chains rattled. Halpin had no more questions. Ray Clark stood to pick at what he perceived as the weakness in her testimony. Could you assign a probability of likelihood to the rape, doctor? When you say very likely, does that mean more likely than not? I believe, she answered, that the source of my speculation would lie in the instruments that might have been used to do this, make such wounds. Clark got her to concede that she had no idea what had caused the vaginal tears. Halpin summoned Sheriff's Homicide Detective Bumcrot to the stand, and he told the jury how he and his partner, Mike Robinson, had received the call and described what he'd observed at the Lang house. He had also attended the autopsy of Mabel Bell in the middle of July, after she'd finally succumbed to her wounds. Halpin asked the detective if he had interviewed Nettie Lang. He said, no, sir. When she would wake up and see me or my partner, she would pull away from us, become extremely fearful, and begin to cry. The best Ray Clark was able to do in cross to distance Richard from this crime scene was to ask if the soda cans had prints on them, to which Bumcrot replied, one of the cans had some portions of a fingerprint, but it wasn't enough to make an identification. Satisfied, Clark ended his cross. Next, Charles van der Wend testified he had found a fabric print on the Mountain Dew can, which meant whoever had held the can had been wearing gloves. Halpin planned to prove glove prints were found at most of the Night Stalker attacks. Clark wanted to show the jury that the print wasn't necessarily a cloth glove, that it might have been a leather glove, but van der Wend testified that they could tell the difference between the texture of the surfaces. For instance, he said, the little pimples in pig leather would be picked up by the lifting tape after fingerprint powders were applied. Clark then had van der Wend tell the jury exactly how the fingerprints were taken. They had already been given that information early on, but Clark wasn't aware of that. When van der Wend finished, Clark suggested the prosecutor show the crime scene pictures now. Judge Tynan addressed the jury. Again, ladies and gentlemen, some of the photographs that you will be looking at this afternoon are not pretty. Remember, you are acting as judges here. You are not to be inflamed or emotionally involved in the photographs. They are evidence. You are to view them as evidence. They, in and of themselves, do not indicate that anybody is guilty of anything in this case. It is just evidence. You must view them as neutrally and objectively as you possibly can. He warned them not to talk among themselves about the prints. Halpin read the numbers of them into the record, and they were passed to the jury by Alan Yokelson. Stone-faced, each juror thumbed through the eight-by-ten black-and-white prints. 
They were passed to the alternates and finally collected by Jokelson. Judge Tynan told the jury they were finished for the day. 38. Judge Tynan apologized to the jury for the air conditioning system not working well. The temperature in the windowless courtroom was in the high 80s or low 90s, and it made this difficult task even more difficult. He told Deputy Martinez to make sure someone from maintenance fixed the air conditioner. Halpin called to the stand Dr. Sarah Reddy, the medical examiner who had performed the autopsy on Mabel Bell on July 19th. Dr. Reddy told the jury that Mrs. Bell had died of cranium cerebral trauma and that there were wounds to her chest, abdomen, back, and buttocks. At Halpin's urging, she said the wounds were those of thermal burns, that is, electricity. Halpin showed morgue photographs of Mabel Bell with tubes protruding from her neck and mouth. The head wound was so severe the surgeon couldn't repair it, and brain matter was still visible. Halpin asked what effect such head wounds would have on the cardiovascular system, and Dr. Reddy said, These severe and fatal head wounds cause the brain tissue to swell and become soft and soggy, and compress the breathing center, and also the heart beating center, and that causes the stoppage of breathing and heartbeat. She told Halpin similar head wounds she'd seen previously had been caused by hammer blows. After conferring with Daniel, Ray Clark said he had no questions. Michelle Lopiesto testified next, telling the jury how it was she who'd picked up the alarm clock with the avia print on it and wrapped up the section of wall with the pentagram on it that Monrovia firemen had cut out for her. Ray Clark asked her questions about sketches she'd made and whether or not she'd found any hairs. There were, Daniel Hernandez had told Clark, human hairs mentioned at the preliminary that hadn't belonged to Richard or to either of the victims. She said she had found some hair under Mrs. Bell's bed, but did not know if these were human hairs. Clark focused on these hairs, but all he could get from Le Piesto was, I don't remember. Clark felt the hairs proved that someone else did it. This was his basic defense strategy, as he really did not see any other viable defense except an insanity plea, which Richard was unequivocally against. Criminalist Lipiesto was excused. Halpin said they were going to move on to Incident 7, that of Carol Kyle. He read into the record the 29 exhibits he'd be using in his presentation of the Kyle matter, then they broke for lunch. Carol Kyle walked into the courtroom like a woman with a mission. Her head was back, her shoulders square, her step sure and confident, and when she sat down she looked directly at Richard. She was clearly not cowed by or frightened of him. He let out a laugh. Halpin had her tell the jury about the night she had been awakened with a gun in her face and a light in her eyes. She testified that she had double-locked the front and back doors and windows, and that she was always careful about making sure the house was secure before retiring. She had had a Lhasa Apso dog back then, and had installed in the rear kitchen door a doggy door, which her attacker had apparently used to unlock a lock and gain entry. She said the doggy door could be locked, but she only locked it when away on vacation. What was the first thing you recall that person saying? Halpin asked. I believe it was, get up and don't make any noise, she said, and went on to describe her and her son's ordeal in detail. Carol's words seemed to hover and quiver in the air as she spoke, evoking vivid images all too clear to the jury in court. She tried to reason with the stalker, telling him that her son's father had been killed. He has been through a lot in his life, she testified, she'd said. His dad died when he was six, and he's had a lot of trauma. Please don't hurt him. And he told me to shut up and took me into my bedroom. She described how in the bedroom he looked for valuables as he made her stare away from him. He called me cunt and bitch. She told the jury how he kept asking her for valuables, that he was obsessed with gold, diamonds, and cash, and how she went to a drawer and reached in to give him a jewelry box. She said, at that point he put the gun to my temple and said, don't ever move fast like that or I'll kill you. Carol testified that he then bound her hands behind her back with her pantyhose, left the room, ransacking as he went, came back and punched her a few times. He then told her to lie down on the bed. She knew what was coming and tried to dissuade him. I told him just that I was having my period, that I had an infection, whatever, you know, to get him to stop. He told me to shut up and that if I made another noise he'd kill me. He put the gun right to my head again. She said he got on top of her and began kissing her. Once he was on top of you and kissing you, what did he do? Halpin asked. Kyle gave a detailed description of the sexual assault. She said she knew he'd kill her if she didn't comply with his demands. 
Women in the audience and in the jury moved uneasily in their seats. Carrillo looked at Cindy Hayden and watched her stare intently at Richard, a blank, curious expression on her face. And for what period of time, Halpin asked. Three minutes. And then what? Then he seemed satisfied, and he got up off of me, and I rolled over. As he was standing at the edge of the bed, he zipped up his pants. He was smiling at me and kind of chuckling and said I wasn't bad for my age. Carol said he wanted more valuables and ransacked her home again, putting things in a pillowcase. She said he then disabled the phone, gave her a robe, and brought her son into the bedroom and handcuffed them together, leaving the key on the mantelpiece where Carol's daughter could find it when she came home. He seemed, she thought, solicitous and oddly courteous. At the end of her testimony, she identified Ramirez as her attacker. Clark had decided to treat Carol like a woman who had made a mistake, not a victim. He was not particularly polite as he stood up and began his cross, first trying to underscore her identification at the lineup, which proved very difficult to do. Carol was positive about her identification of Richard, and no matter how many questions he asked, he could not make her waver. He tried to imply that there hadn't been enough light in the bedroom for her to see her attacker well, and that when she'd first awakened, the light had been in her eyes and she could not make out particular details. However, she did not agree with his hypothesis, saying she had had enough light to see him in the bedroom and that he'd been standing a foot and a half away when she'd looked right at him. Clark then asked her if she had seen photographs of Richard before she had gone to the September 5th lineup. She said she and her son had seen a picture of him on television Friday night, and when she had seen that picture, she'd known he was the man who attacked her. Mark, too, she testified, had said Ramirez was the man. Clark asked Carol if she'd called the police and told them so. She said, he, the next day, as I recall, the same person on the news flash, was apprehended. She explained she'd gone to a class reunion. Her son was home with a friend, and they had inadvertently activated the alarm system, which she had had installed after the incident. The police came to the house that night, and Mark told them at that time that the person that we saw on the TV the night before was the one that was in our house. Ray Clark waited a few seconds, trying to give the jury time to comprehend and appreciate the fact that she hadn't called the police as soon as she'd seen the picture of the man she was claiming was her attacker. He asked her how many times Richard had struck her, and were the blows hard. She said she thought they were given one at a time, the first one the hardest, delivered to her right shoulder blade. Did he deface your home in any fashion, other than strewing these items about in an apparent search for valuable items? Clark asked. Not that I'm aware of. Trying to distance Richard from the Lang Bell incident, he asked, He didn't mark upon your walls, or draw pentagrams or anything on your walls? No. And other than obviously being an intruder in your home at that time of night, he didn't threaten your son. Is that a fair statement, he asked? No. Clark asked her about the type of gun she saw in the attacker's hands, but she didn't know the difference between an automatic and a revolver. He took her back to the lineup and asked her how many words she had heard Richard speak. She said whatever it was that he said, and I don't even remember what it was at this time, I just remember this horrible chill going through me and thinking, that's his voice. Clark moved to the composite Carol had helped put together, and she testified she had never been happy with the first one, that the second one was more like the image she had of her attacker. 39. The following morning, Tynan announced that Arturo Hernandez had called and would not be able to be in court because of another pressing matter. Halpin moved to incident number eight, the murder of Mary Cannon. He introduced photographs of the crime scene and morgue pictures of Mrs. Cannon, showing her gaping neck wounds. At this crime scene, a butcher knife and knife sharpener had been found on the bed next to Mrs. Cannon. Mr. and Mrs. Frank Starich, the couple who lived next to Mary, testified first. Frank told the jury about noticing that Mary's front window screen was down, entering Mary's home to find the ransacking and calling the police. Clark had a few questions about the distance the Starich's house was from Mary's house, and he quickly got Starich to agree he had no idea how the screen he'd found on the lawn had gotten there. Christine Starich repeated with more detail what her husband had said. Halpin wanted to show the jury pictures of Mary's body, but Clark objected on the grounds that they were gross and gory and likely to inflame the jury. Halpin countered that the force and viciousness of the cuts were important to the case and were very much like Jenny Vinko's injuries, which he contended the jury must see. Clark objected strenuously to Exhibit 20G, a close-up of the neck wound. 
Halpin said he would be showing only 201 and 20H to the next witness, Lieutenant Ed Winter, one to identify the victim and one to indicate the wound. Judge Tynan agreed, saying, The body has been cleaned up and the great masses of blood have been eliminated, and they are not pretty, either one of them, but I think they are necessary for the purposes of this trial. Winter described the photos to the jury and testified about the ransacking, the disabled phones, and the arrival of Frank Salerno. Clark understood that the tissue with the avia print on it tied the Cannon crime to other crimes, and he wanted to get Winter to say that it might have been the shoe print of a cop. Using a photograph of all the police and criminalists who'd been present, Clark asked Winter if he'd looked at the soles of the shoes of all ten. He testified that he had. In great detail, Clark had Winter describe the soles of the shoes he was wearing that day. Clark was unable to weaken Winter's testimony. The prosecutor put Dr. John Shipley on the stand, and he testified he had performed the autopsy on Mary Cannon. The cause of death was multiple trauma injuries as a result of blunt force trauma and an encircled wound to the neck to aid strangulation, he said. He described in minute detail the injuries Cannon had suffered, stating that there were at least ten blows with a heavy metal object. Halpin asked about the stab wounds to the neck. Dr. Shipley answered, What we're dealing with are four wounds, one of which is a large combined wound. That is, it has the features of both a stab wound and an incised wound, and then, in addition, there are three small stab wounds to the side of the neck. The single combined wound on the side of the neck is an extremely lethal enlarged wound. The knife penetrates from the side of the neck, and it is responsible for transecting the left carotid artery and then it immediately cuts across the larynx so that it transects the epiglottis, which is the upper portion of the larynx, or voice box, from the lower part, and actually goes into the side of the mouth and back. This testimony was crucial, Halpin felt, because the distinctive stab-slash wound was present in many of the Night Stalker attacks. He asked how long it would take for someone who had sustained such an injury to die. The doctor said a matter of seconds. Halpin's first witness on March 13th was David Bruce Nipp, Mabel Bell's grandson. Walking slowly and not looking in Richard's direction, he took the stand, was sworn in, and identified morgue photographs of Mrs. Bell and Mrs. Lang, and photographs of a cassette player he had bought his grandmother for her 87th birthday on April 6, 1985. Clark tried to suggest the cassette player might have been stolen before the May 29th attack, but without success. The prosecutor called Mark Cranebrink, David's brother, and he testified he had last seen Ma Bell and Nettie Lang two months before the attack, and that they were healthy and well on that occasion. He had gone to see them after the attack of June 1st in the Arcadia Methodist Hospital. They were both in a comatose state and could not communicate or acknowledge him. Halpin asked about the last time he'd seen his aunt, Nettie Lang. He said he had visited her at the Sophia London Hospital the day before, and that she... She just lays in her bed, and she is unable to speak. She can move her head to look at you, but you can't be positive that she knows you are there or knows what you are saying. How is she fed? She is fed through a tube. Halpin moved back to the Cannon incident and called criminalist Lloyd Mahaney, who testified he had responded to a summons by the sheriff's office. He was greeted by Frank Salerno, who directed him to two footprints on the bedroom rug of Mrs. Cannon's home. He cut them out with a carpet knife, and they were rushed to the sheriff's crime lab, where they could be photographed under optimal conditions. Halpin showed the actual pieces of carpet, which over time had lost the impressions, and photographs of the rug with the prints still in them. They were very difficult to see. Clark went at Mahaney with a vengeance. He felt trying to introduce evidence that had once existed but had since disappeared was bogus, and he asked dozens of questions about how he'd cut the rug patch out, what exactly he'd done with it, and was it the right or left foot? The criminal said he didn't know, that he wasn't a footprint specialist. Clark was unable to undermine Mahaney's testimony. In fact, his cross brought out something harmful to the defense. The criminalist described for the jury how he had removed, with a tweezer, pieces of the glass lamp she'd been struck with, glass that had remained embedded in Mrs. Cannon's face. On redirect, Halpin clarified that the prints in the rug had been found in a second bedroom where there had been ransacking, not in the one where Mary had been attacked. Judge Tynan soon recessed court until 1.30, at which point Halpin was going to present the next case. Carrillo and Salerno ate together just about every day they were in court. 
If it was sunny, they'd leave the court building and take a leisurely stroll over to the mall where they would sit outside and eat. It was relaxing to them both. Among the throng of people who worked in the downtown area and were at the mall, no one knew who they were, and they could relax and not think of Richard or the trial. They ate silently and watched people walk by and didn't talk about much. When court started up, Halpin announced they would be jumping forward to the residential burglary and attempted murder in the Bennett assault. He moved into evidence all the exhibits, photographs, the tire iron, and the comforter with the avia print on it, then called Sierra Madre police officer Jerry Skinner, the first policeman to arrive at the Bennett house at 5.06 a.m. on the morning of the assault. He told the jury how he was greeted by Mr. Bennett at the door and appraised the situation, and he said a medevac team had arrived 30 seconds later to take a very badly beaten Whitney to the hospital. He described how he had discovered a bloody tire iron on the floor of Whitney's bedroom, laying on the carpet in the middle of a large pool of blood. Frank Salerno had arrived and taken over the crime scene. Clark cross-examined Officer Skinner, having him repeat much of what he had already said in greater detail. The jury learned nothing new and became fidgety. Halpin told Judge Tynan the victim in this case had to be brought in from out of town and would not be available today. The judge said he understood, congratulated Ray Clark on moving the case along so quickly, and dismissed the jury until 10.30 the following morning. Halpin moved to introduce again the coroner's pictures of Jenny Vinko's neck injuries. Ray Clark objected strenuously, particularly to the fact that they were close-up shots, which made them twice as gruesome as they should be. Tynan didn't agree. He said they were morgue shots of the injuries and should, because the prosecutor was trying to show a similar M.O. in the knife killings, be allowed in. 40. Since the July 1985 attack on Whitney Bennett, Frank Salerno had grown close to the Bennett family, becoming personal friends with Whitney's father, Steve. Frank thought the world of Whitney. She had been through a nightmarish ordeal, yet rarely complained and often smiled when she should have been crying. Since her attack, she had had four operations to repair and remove the damage caused by the stalker. Steve Bennett came to the courthouse with Whitney. Frank and Gill stayed with them in the district attorney's office until it was time to take the stand. Whitney was nervous about testifying. She knew millions of people would be paying close attention to what she said, and she didn't like having to be in the same room as Richard Munoz Ramirez. She thought of him as the embodiment of evil, a human being possessed of demonic force straight from the deep recesses of hell. Frank had come to consider Whitney as almost a surrogate daughter. He was very protective of her, staying close and reassuring her that it would soon be over. Frank's youngest son, Mike, took off work to be in the courtroom when his father would be testifying. Mike was six feet tall, muscular and well-built, with dark hair and large, dark eyes. He was a handsome man who had inherited his father's confidence. Mike was very proud of his dad and wanted to watch him testify. He knew his father had been particularly touched by Whitney and her ordeal. The people call Whitney Bennett, Halpin resumed. Whitney entered the courtroom, took the stand. She was no longer a teenager, but a beautiful young woman with honey-brown hair and large blue eyes. She saw Frank Salerno. He smiled reassuringly. Halpin had her describe for the jury the July 4th night she had been assaulted. She testified about the party she'd been to, coming home very late and going to bed. The next thing she remembered was waking up on her stomach in a pool of blood and much pain about her head and hands. She did not remember being assaulted at all. She testified that she got up and made it to the hallway, where she collapsed and screamed for her father. She said she vaguely remembered him coming to her aid, and the paramedics taking her to the hospital, where she stayed for eight days. And did you continue to receive medical treatment after that? Yes. For how long? Approximately for two and a half years. What about now? Do you still have some medical problems? Occasionally I go and have my eyes checked and cosmetic surgery. I'm still seeing a plastic surgeon. The bone surrounding her left eye socket was smashed and had to be reconstructed. What type of surgery did you have? I had surgery on my hands and my face and my head. Halpin had Whitney recreate the attack for the jury using crime scene photographs of the bloody pink comforter with the avia print on it. Her bedroom dresser, where she testified she had put the jewelry she had been wearing, which was stolen that morning, and the can of Coke she'd taken into her bedroom. Halpin finished and turned her over to Clark, who asked Whitney if she had noticed anything unusual as she had driven home from the party, implying her attacker had trailed her home, 
rather than indiscriminately going in the window, as the prosecution was contending. She repeated that she had not been followed. She'd been speeding because she was late and had kept a close eye on the rearview mirror. Clark seemed intent upon proving Whitney had been followed, and asked her if her window was facing the street and had it been open, implying someone might have seen her through it, despite the fact that the window was above the surrounding landscape. He asks her if she normally kept her window open with the curtains pulled back. She said she had earlier opened the window to tell her dad that he had a phone call and had never closed it. Clark's questions did not undermine Whitney's testimony, and he finished without weakening Halpin's case. The avia print on the comforter he knew tied this crime to others, and he could not change that fact. Judge Tynan thanked Whitney, and she left the stand and headed for the exit. As she moved through the courtroom, Frank's son Mike stared at her intensely, admiring her courage and feeling a tremendous sympathy for her. He thought Whitney had an inner beauty and a gentleness that was rare. Halpin called Steve Bennett to the stand. Steve was a tall man with clean, well-defined features. As he sat on the stand, he looked at Richard, who stared at a yellow pad on the desk in front of him. Bennett told the jury he and his friends had sat outside that night and watched the fireworks display over the San Gabriel Valley. He wasn't sure whether or not he'd locked the front door. He described how he'd gone to bed and awakened to Whitney's screams, finding her beaten beyond recognition. The tire iron was on the floor of his daughter's room when he went to get a pillow to place under her head. Halpin told the court he would be moving to the next count because there were no more witnesses in the Bennett matter. Then, looking at Frank Salerno, he changed his mind and said he'd put Frank up next. Clark stood and said that he was not ready to proceed because the special master was still having difficulties getting samples of evidence from the prosecutor's office. He asked for a hearing, based on papers the defense had presented to the court and the district attorney's office the day before. Judge Tynan had set the 24th to hear that motion, and Halpin said he wouldn't be ready to argue until then. Tynan told him he would dismiss the jury until 1.30 so he could study the motion now. When the court resumed, Tynan announced he had gotten a note from juror number 11, Maria Santos, which said that Steve Bennett was an employee of Southern California Gas Company, where she, too, was employed. Judge Tynan called Halpin, the defense team, and juror Santos to the bench. She said she had seen Bennett in the company cafeteria, but did not know him personally, nor had she ever spoken to him. At Judge Tynan's questioning, she said this would not in any way affect her judgment or decisions. Tynan saw no problem, and neither Clark nor Halpin had any objection. Carrillo and Salerno worried that Maria Santos would be disqualified, and that alternate juror Cynthia Hayden would take her place. They did not want her on the jury. They had often caught her staring at Ramirez with an intensity that made them uneasy. Aware of issues pertinent to appeals, Judge Tynan agreed that Richard should be told about this development. Halpin didn't want to be close to Ramirez at a sidebar, and said so. Well, go back to your seats, the judge offered. Halpin knew Richard hated him. For all he knew, Richard was capable of jumping on him and trying to bite his throat out. He did not trust Ramirez in any way. To Halpin, Ramirez was as dangerous and unpredictable as a rattlesnake. Richard was brought in shackles from the holding pen to sit at the defense table. Clark leaned over and told him about Santos's working at the same company as Bennett. Richard's brows knitted together. He asked Clark and Hernandez what they thought, and they both said they had no problem with her still serving. Clark thought he would go along with their advice, but Richard didn't see it the way his defense team did. He said had he known she worked in a company where Steve Bennett was an executive, he would have said he didn't want her, right from the get-go. No matter what she says, she's fucking affected by him, if not consciously, then subconsciously. That's her boss, man. Richard's point was not lost on Clark. If Richard didn't want her, she had to go. I want her off the panel, he said with finality. Clark turned to Judge Tynan and said, Mr. Ramirez, in light of this fact, does not wish her to serve. He feels that it is, that there is something to it, the relationship, even though it's not apparently a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but it is something that had he known at the time, he would have urged defense counsel to exercise a challenge. Halpin had no objections. It seems to me appropriate, if that is what the defendant wishes, and he is correct, we really don't know what, what may exist. We don't know at this point whether the witness might be somewhere in the chain of the juror's command. We didn't get into that but I think the position of the defendant's table is well taken. Halpin knew that if Santos stayed on the jury after Ramirez requested her removal, there would more than likely be an automatic reversal if there was a conviction. 
Halpin wanted to avoid giving Ramirez more ammunition than he already had because of the Hernandez's lack of experience in capital crime cases. He still felt that Judge Soper had erred severely when she'd okayed the Hernandez's as defense counsel. Judge Tynan turned to the defendant and said, That is your request, is it, Mr. Ramirez, that juror Santos be excused for cause because of the relationship with the witness? Yes, Richard said in a strong voice, and that was the end of juror Maria Santos. The judge asked her to be brought out and patiently told her of the court's decision, apologizing for having to dismiss her. She said thank you and left. Judge Tynan ordered the jury to be brought in and told them Santos had worked where Mr. Bennett was employed and for that reason had to be discharged. He asked his assistant, Josephine, to draw an alternate name from the round drum. Cynthia Hayden sat upright, leaning forward, hoping to hear her name. She locked eyes with Richard. Josephine read the name Donald G. McGee, and Gil, Frank, and Phil Halpin all sighed in relief. Mr. McGee left the alternates and took place number 11 in the jury box. Cynthia Hayden was clearly disappointed. Salerno was recalled to the stand. All the newspeople were anxious to know what he had to say. They knew he had spearheaded the two largest serial killer cases in California's history. Frank told the jury he had arrived at the Bennett residence a few minutes after 9 a.m., and Carrillo had gotten there five minutes later. He said he saw a bloody print on the windowsill, the tire iron, and the pink comforter. As of that morning, had you seen similar shoe prints? Halpin asked. I had seen similar impressions at the Cannon residence, and I was aware of a similar shoe print that was found at the Zazera location after reviewing the photographs of that crime scene with Detectives Uloth and Smith and my partner. Halpin then had Frank describe the visit to Methodist Hospital with Carrillo to see Whitney Bennett before she'd been bandaged. Frank identified the photograph he'd taken that showed a very badly beaten, unrecognizable teenaged girl. Clark was very aware of Salerno's reputation as a thorough, tenacious pursuer and investigator who did his homework and came prepared. Clark focused his attention on the phone, knowing severed phone lines had been found at most of the Night Stalker crimes. He wanted to show the jury the Bennett's phone line had not been severed, but a photograph of the cut line made that impossible. After the lunch break, the prosecutor said they would move on to the tenth incident, the murder of Joyce Nelson. Halpin knew the avia print had actually been left on Mrs. Nelson's face, and it was now fresh in the jurors' minds. Court resumed. Halpin moved Exhibits 12M to 120 into evidence, which related to the Bell incident. The jury was brought out, and he read into the record all of the exhibits pertaining to the Joyce Nelson attack, then put Joyce's neighbor, Bob Blanco, on the stand. He told the jury how he'd become suspicious when he'd gone out to get the paper at 6 a.m. and noticed that a gate linking their two yards was open and that the rear door to the Nelson house was also open. When the door was still open at 9 a.m., he had approached the rear patio, called Joyce's name, and noticed a screen had been moved. Receiving no response at the front door, he'd pushed it open. He saw that a dresser drawer was ajar, like someone was going through them. He called another neighbor, Clifford Sharp, and the police were summoned. On cross-examination, Clark had Mr. Blanco testify to what had happened that morning again and again until the end of the proceedings that day. 41. Court resumed with Halpin introducing all the photographs relevant to the Sophie Dickman attack. That done, a heated argument between the prosecutor and the defense team erupted over the material the special master was supposed to have gotten from the district attorney's office. Halpin complained that the defense team had just given him a long list of numbers without any description of the materials. He said the defense had been dragging their tails for years and suddenly they wanted everything all at once. He was clearly angry and frustrated. Halpin was afraid the court would give the defense team a long period of time to review all the material they were now demanding. Tynan said he had no such plans and added he thought an argument had been hammered out. He'd signed a rider that was prepared by the prosecution and everyone had been in agreement as to the manner in which it was handled. Halpin felt he was being spoken down to by Judge Tynan in open court and requested a hearing. Judge Tynan tried to work out the complicated business of the DA's office sharing all the evidence with the defense forensic experts. He told both sides to have their experts in court on the 24th that he would order the special master there too. Until then, he wanted the trial to proceed as smoothly as possible. 
The jury was brought out, and Frank Salerno returned to the stand to testify that he'd arrived at Mary Cannon's house at 10.35 a.m. on the morning of the 2nd. He saw the broken pane of glass in the window the killer had used to gain entry, and the footprints on the rug. He got down on his hands and knees with a flashlight, scrutinized the prints, had them photographed, cut them out of the rug, tacked it to the plywood, and rushed it to the sheriff's lab. He described finding a tissue on the floor with the distinct footprint of the avia in blood. Halpin showed Salerno a close-up photograph of the victim as she was discovered. Her left arm is bent at the elbow and back behind her, with the palm of her hand facing up, he said, describing her pose for the jury. There is a broken lamp, a milk-glass-type lamp, that is on the bed directly next to her left elbow, and on the bed here, on the left side, I found a knife that was approximately ten inches in overall length, that was blood-soaked. And up in the area of the shoulder and face, did you find other material? I found what would appear to be pieces of the broken lamp about the bed, near her face. I found pieces of the broken lamp actually in her head and hair, and the pillow to the right of the victim is, had, what appeared to me, blood-soaked into it. Halpin had Frank now tell the jury how he had found that same shoe print in the planter area in the front yard, and on the rear patio porch of Joyce Nelson's residence in Monterey Park on July 7th. Salerno testified to assigning two detectives to learn everything they could about that particular shoe, the avia aerobic. Frank was about to tell the jury what he'd been told about the shoes when Clark objected, calling it hearsay. Halpin said it wasn't hearsay that he was not asking for the truth of the matter, just an opinion. Judge Tynan reserved his ruling until after lunch. During lunch, Doreen grabbed a hamburger in a nearby fast food place. She wished she could bring Richard a nice lunch they could eat together in his little cell. As Doreen ate, she wrote Richard one of the several love letters she sent him each day. In them, she made observations about what was going on in court. She didn't miss much and often had astute insights. Richard had grown to trust and care for Doreen very much. She was, he'd come to believe, totally dedicated to him. She was probably the first woman he'd ever trusted. When court reconvened, Judge Tynan told the jury that Frank's observations of the shoe prints were noted merely to indicate the avenues he had taken in his investigation, not that the shoe was any particular brand. Halpin asked Frank to explain to the jury the great lengths the police department had gone to in analyzing and identifying the shoe print. He stated they'd even sent criminalist Burke to Portland, Oregon, to interview the developer of the Avia Aerobic, a Mr. Jerry Stubblefield. Halpin showed Frank crime scene photographs of Joyce Nelson as he had discovered her that day, and Frank said he noted the imprint of a shoe on the left side of her face, though he could not discern any particular pattern. Clark knew the avia print connected the crimes. Although the district attorney had no proof they were ever on Richard's feet, he would do what he could to undermine Frank's testimony. On cross, he asked Salerno if the shoe prints had a serial number that distinguished them from all other shoes. Frank said, not that I'm aware of. Clark asked a few more questions about the samples Burke had brought back from Oregon and whether or not Avia had a copyright on the sole, which it did. Clark was soon finished. Surprisingly, he did not ask Frank if such shoes were ever found in Richard's possession. Halpin now moved to the Sophie Dickman attack, residential burglary, rape, and sodomy. His first witness, Dr. Gerald Bross, had examined Miss Dickman when she'd been brought to the emergency ward the morning of the incident. He stated he had given her a complete physical examination, finding rips and tears in the genital area and damage to Miss Dixon's anus, where there were also tears and some bleeding. Clark had no questions, and Bross was dismissed. Sophie Dickman told the jury that she had a master's degree in psychiatric nursing supervision and had worked as a psychiatric nurse for 38 years. Halpin wanted her to identify Richard, but she had not worn her glasses and now had trouble distinguishing him from Daniel Hernandez. Halpin had to refer to Daniel's beard for clarification. Miss Dickman described how she was awakened at 3.20 a.m. as the light in her bedroom suddenly came on. There was a man standing in the doorway, very tall, very thin, dressed in black with black gloves on. He had a gun in his hand. He came round the table that the lamp was on, put the gun to my head, and his hand over my mouth, and said, If you make a sound, I'll kill you. She took a deep breath and described the gun as a silver metal automatic. Halpin asked her if she knew the difference between an automatic and a revolver. 
She said she did. I was on the rifle and revolver team of Los Angeles County. She stated she was ordered to stand up, turn around, and put her hands behind her back. Embarrassed by her nudity, she told her attacker that the shutters were open. He pushed them closed and put handcuffs on her. He had ransacked her home, noticing immediately she had slipped off her sapphire and diamond ring to hide it. He made her lie on the bed, pulled off her underwear, and put one of his gloves in her mouth, telling her to bite down on this so you don't scream. She said the glove was leathery and had vertical and horizontal ridges, which she felt with her tongue. She told how he put a pillowcase over her head, threw himself on her, and proceeded to rape her. He asked her if she was enjoying it. Several jury members stared at Richard in wonder. Miss Dickman said the sexual attack lasted two minutes. I realized that he didn't have an erection. He was just thrusting and pounding, and that was it. He turned me over after two minutes and tried sodomy. You say tried. What was it he did? He was thrusting and pounding against the rectal area, except it was more like my tailbone. Your hand still cuffed behind you? Yes. And could you feel the defendant's genital area there against your rectal area? It was against my tailbone. It felt like I was being torn in two. How, alternate juror Cynthia Hayden wondered, did it feel like she was being torn in two if he didn't have an erection? And how did she get those tears Dr. Bross had told the jury about? Halpin seemed to come to the same conclusion. Could you, he said, determine at any time if the defendant actually penetrated your genital area? I don't think so. He didn't have an erection, she said. Carrillo looked at Salerno with a curious expression on his face. They both knew semen had been removed from Sophie Dickman by Dr. Bross at the emergency room of the hospital. At this point, Judge Tynan recessed for the day. He asked Miss Dickman to come back at 10.30, and she and the jury were excused. Tynan asked Halpin and Clark to come up to the bench. He wanted to know why Miss Dickman had said she wasn't raped, and if the charge of rape should be amended to attempted rape. Halpin explained that Dr. Bross said she was confused about what exactly had happened to her. He wanted to leave the charges as they were because the attempt is included in the act itself. I just asked, the judge said. In the morning, Sophie took the witness stand again, facing a sun-glassed, angry-faced Richard Ramirez. She saw Richard as a mentally ill person who had no right being free in society. She believed that the forces that drove him were totally out of his control. Because she understood the ways of the psychopath, she harbored no wish for revenge. She just wanted him locked away, forever. On the second day of her testimony, she seemed more composed than she was wearing her glasses. Halpin, like everyone else, noticed and asked her about them. She said she was nearsighted and could only see well for four or five feet. Halpin showed her the pictures of the crime scene, her home, and the pieces of jewelry that had been stolen, before directing her attention back to Richard. He asked if he looked different today than he had then. She said his hair was different and that he was wearing a suit and tie. Daniel Hernandez stood for the cross-examination. He asked her if she was married or divorced. Divorced. And did you see your husband at all that evening, he asked. I hadn't seen him since 1965, she said, derailing his intent to apply she had had sexual relations with someone other than his client earlier that evening. Daniel proceeded to have her again take the jury through what the man dressed in black had done to her getting her to agree that she had told him at the preliminary that her assailant's shoes were dark canvas topped with a white line around the sole, and not the now infamous avia aerobics. Daniel tried to create a scenario in which she'd never truly seen her attacker because he had ordered her from the beginning not to look at him. This, combined with her bad eyesight, the poor light, and her having a towel placed over her head for much of the time, would prevent her from ever getting a good look at her attacker. He suggested she had chosen Richard because she had seen his picture in the news when he'd been arrested and heard comments by public officials promoting his guilt. She denied she'd told the police her assailant had been dressed like a camper and was five foot eight. No, I did not, she countered. Daniel asked if she had told the police her assailant was not Latino, and she said yes. She said he wasn't a Latino, Oriental, or black. Judge Tynan interrupted, saying he had to go to a meeting. As the courtroom cleared, Cindy Hayden and Richard stared at one another, to Doreen's displeasure. When court resumed, Daniel had a police report from Detective Corrigan, 
the officer Sophie Dickman had spoken to at the Monterey Park station the morning of the assault. Do you remember telling the person that you spoke to at the police department after the incident that the person looked like a hiker or mountain climber? Never, she said. Daniel smiled faintly. You don't remember that? I know I didn't say it. Her brows knit together and her lips tightened against her teeth. Daniel asked permission to show her the report. He seemed calmer and more in control of himself than at the beginning of the trial. Having Ray Clark lead the defense team had taken a very draining strain off Daniel's shoulders. He handed the report to Sophie and he pointed to the third paragraph down. She read carefully. The first sentence I did say. He smelled leathery. But the rest of the sentence, no. The report read that she had stated her attacker was dressed as a hiker or mountain climber. Daniel again asked her if that didn't refresh her memory, and Halpin interrupted, saying, Excuse me, Miss Dickman had already indicated that she did not tell him that. I will allow the question, overruled. You didn't say that, did you? the judge asked her. No, I didn't, she repeated. Then the report is incorrect. That line is... Daniel again asked her if she had told Detective Corrigan her attacker was not Latino. I don't know if I said it that way. Daniel directed her attention to the second sentence of the second paragraph. Does that refresh your memory as to having told the officer whether or not you told the officer that the person was not Latino at that time? Well, I don't remember if I said it, if I said it at the time, but I did say he was not black, oriental, or Latino. Okay, Daniel said, and he had what he wanted. Salerno, Carillo, and Halpin all knew Dickman had very bad eyesight and wanted her off the stand as soon as possible. She was not a good witness for the prosecution. Daniel moved on to the cans of soda she had found out of the refrigerator and on the floor of the rear patio. He knew there weren't any prints on them and asked her if they'd been there before the incident. No, she said. He then asked her about the community meeting she'd attended in Monterey Park, if she had spoken there, to which she again said no. He wanted to know if the composite sketch she helped prepare was passed around at the meeting. She said it was. Daniel smiled. And the description that was on it, was that also your description? I don't remember, she told him. Doreen squirmed uneasily in her chair. Clearly, Dickman had described someone other than Richard but wouldn't admit it, Doreen would later say. Daniel reminded Sophie that at the preliminary she had told him the leaflet passed out at the Monterey Park meeting had the description she had given on it. Well, she said, I don't remember telling you that, but if I did, I did. With her testimony damaged on several points, Daniel soon finished and turned Mrs. Dickman back over to Halpin, who was eager to repair the damage. He moved back to the lineup, and she said she had no confusion that Richard Ramirez was the man who had raped her and stolen her jewelry and dignity. How close did you get to him at that time during the lineup? I got up on the stage and walked past him and back again, only eighteen inches from him. Do you have any idea how this description of a mountain climber got into somebody's mind? I cannot imagine, she said, with a slight touch of indignation. He showed her another flyer of the night stalker suspect, which she said she'd had nothing to do with. Halpin put it down where the jury could see it. Daniel objected to the jury being exposed to this other composite without it being admitted as evidence. The judge agreed with him, and Halpin put the flyer in his folder. Halpin asked why she hadn't called the police when she first saw Richard's picture on the tube. First, it was eleven o'clock at nightly news. Secondly, I just figured they knew what they were doing. That is their job. They didn't need any hints from me. Daniel asked her more questions about how many times she had actually seen Richard's picture before the lineup. Richard hated Halpin. He viewed him as the embodiment of all that was wrong with the legal system. He often dreamt about Halpin, saw him in his dreams with horns protruding from the top of his head, devil-like. Alternate juror Cynthia Hayden was becoming nervous about getting on the jury. There were only five more cases which had to be presented, and the trial would be over. Still, she knew deep inside it was her destiny to be called. She just wished it would happen soon. When she and the other alternates and jurors entered the courtroom on Monday, Richard was already sitting at the defense table. He looked at her long and hard with his black eyes, deadpan. His stare-made tingles slide up and down the skin on her back. Doreen, ever vigilant, noticed him looking at her. Then she saw Hayden smile at Richard. It made her angry. Ever since the Valentine incident, 
Doreen had perceived Cynthia as a rival for Richard's attentions and affection. She only hoped Hayden wasn't picked if another juror had to leave the trial. Newspaper delivery person Lowney Dempster was called. However, before she could begin, the defense handed the court a motion to exclude her testimony because, as made clear at the preliminary, she was not certain of the days on which she said she'd seen Richard. The judge read the motion and offered the defense the opportunity to state their claim. Tynan ruled her testimony would go to the weight rather than the admissibility of what she stated and was going to allow it in. Halpin moved into evidence a large Thomas guide map and color photographs of the Pontiac. Lowney Dempster told the court about the three occasions she had seen a man in black near the Doy and Nelson residences and on San Patricio in Monterey Park. She identified Richard as the man she'd seen. On cross, Clark tried mightily to undermine Dempster's testimony, but she was strong and unwavering and wasn't about to let any defense lawyer get the better of her. 42. The following day, Halpin told the court he would, because of conflicting schedules, have to move on to the next case, the murders of Max and Layla Knighting, Incident Number 12. Glendale officer John Perkins joined Halpin at the prosecutor's table. Halpin first introduced all the exhibits, then called a friend of the Knightings, Roy Tesley Murley, who testified he had seen both Max and Layla alive and well at the Seventh-day Adventist Church on the evening of July 19, 1985. The defense had no cross. Mr. Murley was dismissed, and the Knighting's daughter, Judith Arnold, took the stand. As she was sworn in, she looked in Richard's direction. Like her parents, she was devoutly religious and viewed Richard as an actual extension of Satan, the embodiment of evil. Without drama or tears, she told the jury how she'd gone to the restaurant that morning, then to the house, seeing her parents' car in the driveway, and entering the house through the rear door, which was ajar and had a broken window. I walked down the hallway and found them in the bedroom. She took a long, deep breath and fought to hold back the tears the bloody sight of her parents brought on. She said her husband had called the police. Halpin did not question her about the condition her parents were in when she'd found them. He had the photographs, the most brutal and bloody of the trial, to show the jury, and he knew the pictures would speak for themselves. Clark had no questions for Mrs. Arnold. Next was Ella Francis, another daughter of Layla and Max Nightings. Halpin, using photographs, had her tell the jury about the individual items she recognized as her parents at the property viewing room. When he showed her a photo of her mother's wedding ring, she began to cry. She identified a few other pieces of jewelry and was dismissed. Halpin wanted to give the Nighting crime scene photographs to the jury, but Clark said the morgue shots were brutal and would inflame the jury, citing a blow-up of the stab-lash wound on Mrs. Needing, which Halpin felt was important for the jury to see. They argued, and Tynan finally agreed to exclude some of the pictures. Halpin next called Detective John Perkins. The prosecutor had Perkins describe in detail the specifics of the horrendous wounds the Nightings had sustained. The jurors and alternates looked at Richard. As usual, he sat slumped in his chair, his chained ankles crossed, his jaw resting on the palm of his right hand. Halpin asked Perkins to identify the bullets taken from the bodies of the Nightings. He described in graphic detail all the wounds, both knife and gunshot, that he'd observed at the autopsy. When the afternoon session started, Halpin said he was not able to get the doctor who had done the autopsies on the Nightings to court until the following week, so he was going to present the 13th case, the murder of Chenorong Kovananth and the beating and rape of Somkid Kovananth. The prosecutor put all the evidence he'd be using on the record, then called Somkid to the stand. Doreen was not in court. No one had been available to babysit for Somkid's five-year-old daughter, and Doreen had volunteered. Somkid thought she was in some way attached to the court. Doreen watched the child in the hall as Somkid testified. Somkid told the court she'd been born in Thailand and English was not her first language. She spoke so softly that Halpin suggested she bring the microphone forward. She told the jury how her husband had come home that night and hadn't gone right to bed. It was very hot, and she'd gone to sleep on the couch in the living room. The patio glass door was open, but the screen door was closed, though not locked. She was awakened by the sound of the screen door sliding open. Some kid had a Thai accent and spoke without syntax. "'What did you see?' Halpin prompted. I see a tall, skinny man with a gun. Did he say anything to you? 
Yes, he say, shut up, bitch, do what I tell you, if not, I'm going to kill you. And she went on to describe how the stalker went into the bedroom where her husband was sleeping. She heard a gunshot. And after you heard the gunshot, did the man come back to where you were? Yeah, the man come back, say, I killed your husband already. What else did he say? Do what I tell you, if not, I'm going to kill both of your kids. She told him she would give him anything he wanted if he did not hurt her children. He ripped her nightgown off, took her to the bedroom, said, This is your husband. He's already dead. He then slapped her to the floor, put the gun to her head, raped her. Shaking, trembling, crying, she continued her testimony, describing how he bound her hands with electrical wire he cut from a hairdryer in the bathroom and beat her. Some kid testified that he then orally raped and sodomized her. The alarm in her son's room had gone off, and her tormentor had gone to the boy's room, tied him up, then returned to her and bound her legs with a belt. He then proceeded to the kitchen, returned drinking apple juice and demanded valuables and jewelry. He took her to the kitchen and she showed him where she had stashed her expensive pieces taped under a kitchen drawer. He put the things he wanted in a pillowcase and soon left. She then untied herself and ran to her son. Sobbing heavily now, she described returning to the bedroom with a neighbor, anxious to see if the intruder had truly killed her husband. She said, as the jurors looked on spellbound, several of the women and two of the men crying, even hardened seasoned reporters cried. I just opened the cover and I see him is gunshot on the side of the head. I know he's dead and the police and the neighbors pulled me out. I don't want to go out. Halpin offered her water and tissues to dry the tears. He then proceeded to show her the crime scene photographs, and they further fueled some kid's terrible, suffocating grief. Seeing her testify was one of the saddest things I've ever been exposed to in a courtroom, Gil Carrillo would later say. Just about brought tears to my eyes. Finally, Halpin asked, Do you see the man in the courtroom today? Without hesitation, she raised her right hand and pointed at Richard. He grimaced at her, then laughed. She began to cry harder. Halpin showed her a photograph of Chenaron Covenant as he lay dead. Is that the way you found him that morning? She said it was, and totally broke down. Clark, during the cross, brought out the fact that the light in her home had been poor when the stalker had entered, but she said she had gotten a good look at him, particularly when he had put on the bathroom light. Clark tried to undermine the description she had given the police by suggesting she had described her attacker as a white man. She denied it saying she had told the police he had brown skin, like a Mexican, and curly black hair. Clark asked her if she had seen Richard's picture on television and in the newspaper, intimating that was why she had picked him out at the September 5 lineup. She answered with resolution, But I know it is him because I never forget his face, even today. And no matter how hard he tried, Clark could not dissuade her. Diane Fitchner, the first police officer to reach the Covenant residence that morning, was called next. Reading from her report, she stated that some kid had said that he was a male, possibly Hispanic, about six foot, thin build, about thirty to thirty-five years of age, and he had wavy brown hair, soft waves, light curls, and he was wearing brown pants and a blue, multicolored type shirt. Did you then broadcast that description? She said she had. Clark asked several questions about some kid's description before court was recessed for the evening. The next witness was Carlos Brizolara, who testified he and his partner, Al Michelorena, arrived at the Covanath residence at 9.08 a.m., the morning of the 20th. Halpin had Brizolara recreate the crime scene for the jury. The prosecutor showed him photos of the ransacking and phone disabling, which were the stalker's signature. Halpin made sure the jury saw a close-up of Chainerong's gunshot wound, which was identical to Vincent Zazara's and Elias Abowitz's gunshot wound. He also showed Brizolara photographs of size eleven and a half shoe prints that had been discovered about the house. On cross, Ray Clark was unable to put distance between his client and the Sun Valley crimes. Brizolara was dismissed, and Halpin told the court he would again have to put a witness on the stand out of order because of conflicting schedules. He would present incident number 14, the attack on the Petersons, the next-to-last count. Judge Tynan said fine, Clark told the judge that Richard was not feeling chipper and wanted to waive his right to be in court the following day for a hearing. 
Tynan agreed, and the paperwork was completed and signed by Richard. Richard was convinced the guards at the jail were still putting something in his food to poison him. He was always listless and without energy. All his joints ached, and he felt sick in the morning. His dreams were becoming more and more bizarre, which he blamed on the poison. He didn't want to eat, but there was no other source of food. They had me locked up twenty-four hours a day. No exercise, no fresh air, no nothing. They were trying to kill me slowly, and they were succeeding. I felt like I was dying, he would later relate. He complained to Doreen about his food being poisoned. She wrote articulate letters to the jail's warden, but nothing changed. Assistant District Attorney Yokelson read the exhibits in the Peterson matter into the record and called Virginia Peterson to the stand. Virginia was a large woman with wide, square shoulders and had a strong, powerful gait. She gave Richard a dirty look on reaching the stand. She was sworn in and told the jury about the morning she was awakened by a footstep and saw a man pivot into her bedroom from the living room where the light had been left on by her husband. He was, she said, ten feet away. Can you describe him as you saw him then? He was over six feet tall, he was wearing dark clothing, and he had shaggy dark hair. What was his build? Halpin asked. He wanted the jury to know Virginia had gotten a good look at the man. He was lean, muscularly built, not lean as in skinny. He was holding a gun in standard combat position, she said. Did that image put you in mind of something? Is there some way that you can describe it as it appeared to you at that time? Halpin asked. Someone was sneaking into the house. Someone was intruding. Did you say anything? I sat up in bed and I said, Who are you? What do you want? Get out of here. And was there any reply from the man? Shut up, bitch. Where is it? She stated the intruder had said. She described being shot, falling back into bed and feeling numb. The intruder's laughter, her husband waking up and his being shot, though he still jumped out of bed and ran at the intruder, who fired a third round at her husband, then a fourth shot. Her husband had gone down, but he'd come back up and the two men had grappled. Her daughter had been screaming, and she, choking in her own blood, had retrieved her child and called 911. Halpin showed her photographs of her house for her to describe to the jury, then asked if she saw her attacker in the courtroom. She pointed at Richard. Richard's eyes were covered by sunglasses. He laughed, making her skin crawl. Halpin asked, at the time you saw the defendant enter your room with his hands up in front of him, could you see his hands? Yes, she said. Could you describe their appearance? They stood out from the rest of him in that they were much lighter in color, and I was struck by how long and how large they were. All eyes in the room, even Judge Tynan's, moved to Richard's hands. They, like his father Julian's, were huge, and now they rested on the defense table defiantly. The prosecutor asked her if she could tell if he'd been wearing gloves. It could have been gloves, she said. Clark began his cross of Virginia after the lunch recess. Virginia was a difficult witness. She was sure of herself and had all her facts straight. She did not cry or become overwhelmed by emotion, and the hatred she harbored for Richard was real and tangible, easy for the jurors to perceive. He began by clarifying the amount of light she had to see her attacker. She conceded it was a hundred-watt bulb under a shade, three feet off the ground, in a lamp against a wall in the living room. He used a diagram of her home and had her draw an X where the lamp would have been, which she said was about seventeen feet away. He asked her if the intruder was only backlighted. She agreed, but added, at times the light shone directly on his face by the way he was standing. Clark asked her how many times she had seen Richard's face on television and in the newspapers before she'd viewed the September 5th lineup. The question could only help Richard. There was no way Clark knew Virginia Peterson hadn't seen Richard's face multiple times before September 5th. She testified she'd seen his picture on TV six or seven times. On redirect, Halpin returned to the intruder's hands, making sure the jury would not miss the resemblance between Richard's and the hands Virginia described. Halpin moved all the photographs of the Nighting and Kovanath incidents into evidence. Judge Tynan then addressed the jury, complimenting them on their behavior through the long weeks. After his remarks, the Nighting and Kovanath photographs were distributed among the jurors and alternates. Halpin wanted the images to stay with the jurors on the upcoming long Easter weekend. Tynan explained to Richard that he would not have to attend the hearing in the morning involving the differences between the special master for both the defense and the prosecution 
if he didn't want to. Richard did not want to be present and signed a 977 waiver. The following morning, without the defendant or the jury present, Halpin argued his position on why the defense was not being given all the pieces of evidence they were asking for. He felt what the defense wanted was unrealistic, that their requests for material were lacking specificity, and that they failed to refer to the number system which appeared in reports throughout the case. He was also concerned about the length of time the defense was seeking to do their tests, which in truth should have already been done. Halpin accused the defense of purposely trying to sabotage the trial. Clark's answer was put to Brian Raxall, the defense special master, on the stand. He was questioned by Clark, then grilled by Halpin, as Judge Tynan listened and made copious notes. He wanted this decision to be the right one. He did not want to be responsible for Richard getting a reversal if he was found guilty. Tynan thought this likely, as too many eyewitnesses put Richard Ramirez into the Night Stalker's large shoes. He listened to arguments until the court reporter requested a break. Then Judge Tynan finally ruled on exactly how all the items would be shared by the prosecution and the defense, and he recessed court for the weekend. 43. That weekend, Ruth traveled to Los Angeles to visit Richard. It was a long, difficult trip. Early Saturday morning, she stood in line with the others who were waiting to see the 6,000 individuals housed at the L.A. County Jail. Ruth nodded hello to a few familiar faces, but stood alone. She was the sister of the Night Stalker, and no one wanted to get too close. When Richard was brought down, he was in a foul mood because of the poison he was certain they were putting in his food. He complained, and Ruth listened with a patient ear and looked at him with sympathy and much love. All week, every moment of every waking minute, Richard wore a stone-cold face. But when he was with his older sister, it was different. He showed her his true feelings and looked to her for support and understanding, which he received. He was like a little boy all over again, Ruth later related. No matter what, Richie was still my brother, and no matter what, I love him and will be there for him to the end, whatever it is. Richard told Ruth he didn't have a chance. They would surely convict him and send him to San Quentin to die. Ruth hated hearing him talk like that, but she knew it could very well happen, and deep inside she prepared herself for that dreaded eventuality. She tried to give him a pep talk. She was afraid he might go mad and kill himself after all was said and done. She told him how much Julian and Mercedes missed him and loved him, and that Ray Clark was doing a fine job and he should keep up his spirits and not lose heart. You are a Ramirez, she reminded him. Remember that. When Ruth left the jail, she met Reuben for lunch. Ruth would still not go inside Reuben's house because of the running feud with Susanna. That night she again slept in the back of her brother's car, hidden under her raincoat, afraid of the rats, of the police, and of men who got their kicks from hurting women. Ruth knew it was a cruel world filled with people who were capable of terrible things. Richard didn't like her sleeping in the car, and he warned her over and over to be careful. He told Reuben to keep an eye on her, that if something happened to her, their father would go bananas. Early Sunday morning, Ruth went to church, prayed for Richard, prayed for her parents, and prayed that her younger brother would turn away from Satan and embrace Christ. If he was to find salvation, he must stop looking to Satan for redemption. Ruth visited Richard on Sunday, and their half-hour together was spent very much as it had been the day before. Richard complained. Ruth listened attentively with love and understanding. She wanted to go to the trial, to show the world she believed in Richard's innocence, but because she was a potential witness, she still was not allowed in court. That weekend, Ruth met Doreen. She was at first leery of Doreen, but when she realized how much Doreen truly cared for Richard, she embraced Doreen as a friend. When court resumed on Monday, all but one juror looked fresh and more relaxed. Juror Phyllis Singletary looked worried and distracted. Some of her fellow jurors noticed a little swelling around her left eye. They did not ask what had happened, and she didn't offer any explanation. Cindy Hayden knew Phyllis was involved in some kind of abusive relationship, but she was not aware of how truly abusive it was. Cindy wondered if it would be this week that she was finally picked as a regular juror. There wasn't much time left, she realized, though she still felt confident she'd be chosen. Halpin told the jury they would be moving back to the Kovanath attack and put criminalist Charlie Vanderwend on the stand. Vanderwend stated that he and criminalist Gerald Burke had photographed and lifted footprints from several different areas at the Kovanath home. 
The prints were the same as what he'd seen in Joyce Nelson's home and on the clock at Mabel Bell's. Alpin handed him three footprint lifts. The jury could see they were the now familiar Avia aerobic shoe. Because of witnesses' schedules, they would now have to jump forward to the autopsies of Chenereng Kovananth and Elias Abawath. Jokelson read into the record all the exhibits in the last case, number 15, which included residential burglary, murder, rape, oral copulation, and sodomy. Dr. Joseph Kogan was called, and he told the jury he performed an autopsy at 10.30 a.m. on July 21st on Chenereng Kovananth. Halpin showed him photographs of the wound, which was just above the left ear. There was gunpowder residue around the bullet hole, indicating the gun had been very close when fired. Kogan estimated an inch or less. Dr. Kogan autopsied Elias Abawath on the morning of August 9th. The cause of death was also a gunshot wound to the head, also from about an inch away. This projectile was copper-jacketed, while the one removed from Chenereng Kovanath was solid lead. Clark had no questions. Halpin had planned to put Sakina Abawath on next, but she was ill and would not be available until the following day. The prosecutor said he couldn't proceed any further. Court was recessed. Sakina Abawath dreaded being in the same room with Richard Munez Ramirez. In her heart, she was sure he was the man who had robbed her husband's life and her dignity, who'd made her grovel and beg and swear on Satan. Halpin called her name. She timidly entered the courtroom and slowly made her way to the stand, pale and trembling. She had been home in bed with the flu and a sore throat. Sakina was five feet tall, had pearl-black hair, cut short, large black eyes. Halpin hated putting her on the stand, but he had no choice in the matter. In a small voice thick with a Burmese accent, Sakina first told the jury she had awakened that morning at 2.30 to nurse her ten-week-old son. Their other child, a three-year-old boy, was asleep in his room. After she breastfed the child, she turned off the air conditioner, went to the restroom, took a glass of water in the kitchen, and went back to sleep. Halpin knew Clark would question the available light so he had Sakina testify that the nightlight in the bedroom had been on, as well as a lamp in the living room. Sakina said she then heard a popping. All of a sudden someone hit me on the head real hard and turned me on my stomach, and he put handcuffs on me from the back. And what else was done? Halpin asked. Then he started banging me in the ears a couple of times real hard, and then beat me up like this, she said, indicating with open hands over her ears. Crying and sobbing, she went on to describe how her assailant had jumped on the bed and kicked her in the head so hard she landed on the floor, where he'd beaten her still more. He then went to the closet and grabbed a shirt of hers, and with it he bound her feet together. It was extremely difficult for Sakina to talk. She looked at the ceiling as if searching for strength. He said, you bitch, you motherfucker, you don't scream, otherwise I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your kid in the crib, and I'm going to kill your son. Then he stuffed a sock in her mouth. All right, now up until that point, had you said anything? Halpin queried. No, I said. I swear I won't. I swear I won't scream. I swear I won't go out. And he slapped me one more time. And he said, swear up on Satan. And I said, yes, I swear on Satan. I won't scream. Crying now, she said he gagged and blindfolded her, ransacked the house, came back, beat her some more, and demanded valuables. Sakina's hurt and pain reached out and touched everyone in the courtroom. Even Judge Tynan, normally stoic and stone-faced, had tears brimming in his eyes. Halpin asked her, Do you see that man in the courtroom today? Him, she said, pointing. I can identify him in a hundred people, if you like. He is not even big change, except his hair is longer. She stood up, saying, You son of a bitch! Why did you kill him? I give you everything, you bastard! All right, Halpin said. "'Ma'am, I know this is tough for you,' Tynan said. "'I give him everything,' she wailed. "'I understand. Just try and stay calm. Just answer the questions, ma'am. "'If you need time off, we'll give you a few minutes. "'Just try and relax,' Judge Tynan said. "'We have to do this,' Halpin said. "'There are five men sitting at the end of the defense table. "'Him,' she said, indicating. "'The one in the red tie.' "'All right. The defendant, Richard Ramirez, for the record.' Thank you, Judge Tynan said. She sobbed, cried into her hands, and sat down, exasperated and beaten. Clark and Daniel knew Sakina was very bad for the defense. 
The two defense lawyers conferred. They wanted to get her off the stand as quickly as possible. Daniel stood up and said, Your Honor, may we suggest a brief recess? No, you may not, the judge said. Sakina, through tears and gasps for breath, went on to describe being beaten still more as her tormentor demanded cash and her diamond wedding ring. Then she said he'd left and come back after a few seconds. He'd tear off my clothes. And were you still handcuffed behind your back? She said she was, and went on to describe being dragged by the hair to the spare bedroom. And then he'd sit on the bed and he'd take out his penis, and he'd grab me from the hair and he'd pull my mouth on his penis, and I don't want to do it, and he pulls me, he pulls me, she cried out, broke down again, sobbed into her hands, cupped against her tear-soaked face. Halpin, in as gentle a way as possible, led her through the details of the rape. She then told the jury about her son waking up, her going to him handcuffed, soothing him, lulling him to sleep, then back to the bedroom where she was raped again. She said that he tried to sodomize her but wasn't able to consummate the act, although he did vaginally rape her. While he was engaged in this, her son had come walking down the hall. The stalker had grabbed the boy, bound him, and covered him with pillows. You bitch, you don't scream. Tell your son not to scream, otherwise I will kill him. I said, I swear I won't. And he said, swear upon Satan. I said, I swear upon Satan, I won't scream, and I won't let him scream either. With that, she stated, he closed the door and left her and her son tied up. And when he came back, he was carrying the couch pillows, which he put on top of the boy to muffle his pleas. And the boy called out, Mama, please, I can't breathe. Sakina had begged him not to hurt her husband. In response to her plea, the killer laughed, undid her handcuffs, and cuffed her to a doorknob. He asked if someone would be coming in the morning so she could be released. She said yes, and he was gone. She said she first untied her son and sent him to wake up her husband, but Elias wouldn't get up. I get so panic. I thought that maybe he cut this cantaloupe and stuffed it into my husband's mouth, and he wants the scotch tape so he could tape it on Elias's mouth. That's why he couldn't scream or nothing. I figured it out that way. She went on to describe her making the boy go back to his father, telling him to remove anything from his mouth, that she heard her son trying to wake his father up, repeatedly called to him as she screamed, Elias, Elias, wake up! You could hear him saying, Daddy, Daddy, Halpin asked. Yes, and he was doing something, and he came back to me and said, Mama, there is nothing in his mouth, and he's not waking up. And I told him, Mama, go back again and wake him and shake him so he can wake up. And at the same time, I was screaming, Elias, Elias. She wailed, her pain and turmoil filling the courtroom. Women on the jury and among the alternates took out handkerchiefs and tissues and wiped at the tears streaking their faces. Even the male jurors were wiping back tears. Then she said she began the difficult task of getting the boy, still very traumatized and frightened by the stalker, to go out into the night to the neighbors for help. Sakina now told the jury that her neighbors did come, that Bob Wilson went and looked at Elias and came back crying. He didn't tell her Elias was dead, though she knew from Bob's reaction. When the police arrived several minutes later and she was freed, she ran to Elias to see for herself. Phil Halpin wanted to get Sakina off the stand as soon as he could, so he moved to the September 5th lineup. She testified she identified number two and wrote it on the card they gave her. She said she also found jewelry that belonged to her at the property show-up, two gold chains from Pakistan, a set of earrings, and an engagement ring her mother-in-law had given her, among other things, including a television and a VCR. Halpin proceeded to show her dozens of photographs of the inside and the outside of the house, which she described for the jury. Then he came to photograph number 40E, an autopsy photo of her husband's head. She took it in her hand, looked, and her eyes swelled and her face winced in sudden agony. You never showed me that before, she told Halpin, as if she'd been burnt. Please, just tell the jury who that is, Halpin said. My husband. This is my husband. Did he beat him up on the head, too? I didn't know that she said, and again broke down. She turned to the judge. What did he get out of killing him? He's such a nice man. Ma'am, I can't answer that. I'm very sorry. I'm concerned about you now. Do you want to take a little recess? I want to go straight through, she said, anxious to get it over with. I have no further questions, Halpin said. You may cross-examine, Tynan said to the defense. Clark knew he had to be careful with Sakina, 
She was a very sympathetic witness. Before he could get up, Halpin stood and asked her, Did you see anything on his hands? Yeah, she said. He was wearing gloves. That was the answer Halpin was looking for. Did you ever see a picture of the defendant after this happened? No. It is our religion that after the husband died to give him respect. We didn't watch TV. We don't go out of the house. We don't do anything. Just for two months. We give him respect. We just stay in the house and pray and pray for him. And that is what I was doing. What about newspapers? Did you read any newspapers? Halpin asked. You cannot do anything. You pray a lot for him. Thank you, Halpin said and sat down. Clark asked Sakina if the September 5th lineup was the first time she'd been out of her house since her husband's murder, and she said yes. He proceeded to show her the police composite drawing she'd helped to create, and he asked her if she'd ever seen it. She said she had worked with a policeman on it, but I wanted something better than this. It doesn't come out. Clark stopped her and asked her if she'd helped create it. Yes, yes, she said. Did you tell the artist he had light brown or dishwater blonde hair? I told him he got a light face, light colored hairs. This means light in color, he asked. Yeah, I told him that because the, the bathroom light, the restroom light was falling on his head. That is why I said light hair. Clark grilled her about the available light she had seen her attacker in and how many times she'd seen him. She did not weaken or become distressed by Clark's thoroughness. She seemed to reach inside herself and get stronger with each question. He focused on whether she had noted her attacker's shoes. I can't because he's so huge and I'm so tiny. Even if you kick me with the tennis shoes, I can't figure it out because it was hurting on my head so badly. I know that he was hitting me on the head, kicking her, with the shoes. Clark said he had no more and sat down. We are very sorry for your loss and God bless you, Judge Tynan said to Sakina. I hope you do good judgment, Sakina responded, and slowly stepped down from the witness stand. She looked at Richard, and it seemed she was going to fall down. Two court bailiffs rushed to her aid, took her by the arms gently, and led her from the courtroom as she sobbed. Halpin called Deputy Sheriff John Knight, and he told the jury about finding Sakina handcuffed to the door, locating Elias, and kicking the doorknob holding Sakina off the door. Did she give you a sort of description? Halpin asked. Yes, sir. She described the person who was responsible as a light-skinned male Mexican or a dark Caucasian. She described him as being tall, and I stood up in front of her and told her that I was approximately six foot six and asked her where he would come up to on me, and she said, No, somewhere, you know, down by your mouth. And I said, Six, three, six, four, and she nodded yes. Judge Tynan ordered a break for the court reporter, and when court resumed, Halpin put Gil Carrillo on the stand. The prosecutor handed him the remnants of the handcuffs used to restrain Sakina to identify. There was no cross. As Carrillo passed the defense table, Richard smiled and said hello in Spanish. Gill returned the salutation and resumed his place at the prosecutor's table. Judge Tynan told the jury the case would be getting somewhat technical now and suggested they resist the temptation to rest their eyes. If they needed more fresh air or longer breaks, they should let him know. Court was recessed. 44. When Richard returned to his cell, he lay down on his bed and read letters from Doreen and a few of his groupies. He wrote a few letters and fell asleep, dreaming he was in hell with a Satan who had a face like Phil Halpin. He woke in the middle of the night with a start and in a sweat and couldn't go back to sleep. He read Carlos Castaneda for a few hours, dozed off, and was awakened by the guard to get ready for court. He didn't want to go. He viewed the trial as a total farce, and he hated being there, but he had no choice. He sat up, cursing, in a particularly foul mood. Halpin opened by showing a videotape of the lineup to the jurors. He wanted to clear up, once and for all, any ambiguities and accusations that anything untoward had been done at the lineup. The lights were dimmed, and the thirty-five-minute tape was watched in silence. The jurors saw Richard step out from the other five men, walk to the edge of the stage, say a few words, and return to the line. When the tape was over, court broke for lunch. The first witness after the break was Richard's former friend, Donna Myers, flown in from San Francisco with Earl and D.D. Gregg for their court appearances. Of all the people in the world, Richard did not want to see Donna Myers in court. She was the first person he actually knew on the outside to take the stand, and as she was sworn in, he glowered at her. 
Halpin showed her a picture which she identified as Armando Rodriguez. Halpin then asked her if she knew anyone at the defense table. Richard Ramirez Whitney, she said. Judge Tynan asked what count Donna's testimony was relative to, and Halpin said, This will probably go to all of them. Donna described first meeting Richard when she went to El Paso for a visit with Armando in 1979. She saw him again when he went to visit them when they lived in Richmond, California, from 1979 to 1981. Richard had stayed with them when he'd visited. She had moved to San Pablo, and Richard often visited her there, sometimes with Armando, sometimes alone. She stated the last time he'd come to her house was in August of 1985, the 15th or 16th. He came alone, she testified, then with Armando. He gave her an octagonal jewelry box, asking her to hold it for him. When he came back to retrieve it, he gave her a bracelet and three rings, which she then gave to her daughter, Dee Dee, and her son, Lloyd Vorak, who left San Francisco with one of the rings and returned to Utah, where he lived and worked. On August 30th, Donna said she was contacted by San Francisco policemen Frank Falzon and Carl Klotz. She told them where she'd gotten the jewelry, but said she did not know how to find Rick, that he'd stayed in different hotels and moved around a lot. Can you tell us how the defendant customarily dressed when you saw him, help and quizzed? Dark pants and shirt and dark shoes. Did he ever tell you why he dressed that way? So he couldn't be seen so well at night. Did he ever tell you what he was doing at night? Yes, he said he was ripping off people. Did you ever see the defendant wearing gloves? He wore brown cloth garden gloves, she said and went on to state Richard had often brought jewelry to her house and sometimes sent it to his sister. Once he'd given her five hundred dollars for her to hold, with instructions to give it to his sister if anything happened to him. He had not given her an address, just a phone number and the name Ruth. Halpin asked her if she had ever seen any tattoos on the defendant. No, he had a picture drawn of a pentagram on his arm, but it wasn't a tattoo. It was just drawn with ink. Did the defendant ever speak to you about Satan? Yes, he said he was the supreme being. She testified that Richard truly did believe in Satan, and that made him all the more menacing as he sat there with his sunglasses on, staring at Donna Myers like he wanted to take a bite out of her. She said she had seen Richard looking at a handgun Armando had for sale. Richard had said he wanted to buy an Uzi. When Halpin asked her if she knew what Richard was doing with the things he stole, she testified he had a fence in L.A., Richard had also shown her master car keys he had for Datsuns and Toyotas. Was there anything about the defendant's teeth that to you were remarkable, Halpin asked. They were decayed, and one of them was chipped, and they were discolored. She said there was a second time he had left money with her, seventy-five dollars. She ended up wiring it to him in L.A. under the name of Rick Moreno. She stated she saw Richard in possession of Japanese coins in coin pouches in the summer of 1985. Halpin asked about Richard's weight and his build. He was complaining. He was always complaining he was too thin. He used to drink a lot of this stuff called weight on. To gain weight, to gain weight. The prosecutor was pleased. He felt Donna had put everything in perspective and pointed the finger of guilt directly at Richard. Ray Clark knew how much Donna had hurt Richard, and he stood to do serious battle with her. Now, you told Mr. Ramirez that he didn't have the guts to kill anybody, he asked. Yeah, we were talking about it. The reason you told him was that you knew his reputation for peace and quiet, didn't you? You knew his reputation was that of a non-violent person, didn't you, he demanded. He had never been violent around me, she said. That's right, Clark quickly agreed, seizing the opportunity to make Donna Meyer a positive character witness for Richard. And he'd been in your home many, many times, right? She agreed he had been, and that seemed a plus for Richard. Clark returned to his client's passive nature. Okay, and had he in fact been around any relatives of yours? She said he had. Clark asked which relatives. My daughter Deline, most of my relatives. I have a lot of children living in the area. Most of them knew him. The defense lawyer asked questions about Armando Rodriguez, implying maybe he was in some way involved with the crimes Richard was charged with. Clark asked her if Richard had bought the gun Armando had for sale, and she said no. He grilled her on the exact conditions of Richard's teeth when she had last seen him. On redirect, Halpin asked Myers to describe Armando Rodriguez. He's about 5'9", five 5'10". Five he has dark brown hair, he has a mustache, and his hair is kind of medium length. 
Would you say he and the defendant were the same size? No, the defendant is taller and thinner. Armando is a little heavier. The next witness was Earl Gregg, the fellow who had first gone to the San Francisco police and made them aware of Rick Ramirez. Gregg was tall, thin, and unkempt, and he looked like he wasn't eating or washing enough. He was very nervous, and he stole furtive glances at Richard as he took the stand. Halpin had him tell the jury he'd known Richard Ramirez for ten years and had met him through his mother-in-law. He had seen Richard at Donna Mayer's home shortly after Easter of 1985. Richard had tried to sell him a twenty-five automatic and showed him a small-caliber black revolver. Halpin gave him the gun retrieved from Tijuana, and Greg said it looked like the pistol Richard had shown him. Richard had wanted too much for the guns, one hundred twenty-five to one hundred fifty dollars each. It was high. That's why I didn't buy them, he said. He also had a couple of rifles for sale, he added. Clark stood to do the cross on Greg, who was, according to Richard, white trash, a drug user, and a two-bit burglar. Clark asked a few questions about the bags Richard had the guns in, and if he had seen them in a pillowcase at any point. Greg said they were in a brown gym bag with white handles, and he had never seen Richard with any pillowcases. He testified the same gun Richard offered him for $150 he'd bought new in a store for $53. Halpin now said he had a few fill-in witnesses, people who weren't available in the correct chronological order because of previous commitments. He called Dr. Irvin Golden, the medical examiner who had performed autopsies on March and Layla Knighting. He told the jury in gory, heart-wrenching detail about the wounds suffered by the Knightings. Clark had no questions for Dr. Golden. The prosecutor announced he was almost ready to move on to the arrest phase, but he had a few witnesses coming from out of state on Monday and asked if the court could be darkened until then. Clark said he had no objections, and Judge Tynan recessed the proceedings until Monday, April 3rd. Jesse Perez was the first witness called. He took the stand tentatively and was sworn in. Richard hated Perez. He viewed him as a rat, a snitch, the lowest form of life there was in the world Richard had traversed. Perez wore a rumpled jacket, tie, and shirt. He looked like he hadn't slept in a week. He told the jury he was a little hard of hearing, sometimes wore a hearing aid, but wasn't today. He testified he had murdered a man in a barroom fight in Texas and had been arrested for burglary for stealing beer from a bar. Doreen made a face of distaste in Perez's direction, as if he had a bad odor. Richard kept moving. Being near Perez was making him very animated, and each time he moved the chains jingled, rattling Perez, whose eyes constantly darted about. Perez identified Richard Ramirez as someone he had met through his neighbor, Reuben Ramirez, three years before. He drove people around L.A. to Tijuana and back for a living. He had met Richard at the Greyhound bus terminal and started driving him places. He took him to Tijuana a few times and drove him to meet Felipe Solano at a barber shop on Alvarado and 3rd. Richard had told him that Solano owed him money, and he had waited in the car while Richard had spoken to Solano. Perez had a girlfriend in Tijuana who needed a gun for protection, and he had asked Richard if he knew where he could get one. Richard sold him a twenty-two for fifty dollars on credit. Perez, in turn, gave the gun to his friend. Halpin showed him a picture of Richard's green Pontiac, and Perez said he had seen the defendant driving around in it. Halpin moved back to the gun, intent on putting it in Richard's hands. The prosecutor had Perez tell the jury about his two trips down to Tijuana to get the twenty-two from his friend. Perez said he learned of Richard's arrest over the radio just as he and Sheriff's homicide men were crossing the border into Mexico. He testified he got the gun, gave it to the homicide detectives, and returned to L.A. with them. Daniel Hernandez's first question to Perez was to ask if the gun he received from Richard was loaded. That's right, Perez said. Daniel didn't elicit anything that could help Richard until he asked Perez when he'd bought the twenty-two from Richard. Perez said he didn't know, that he had nothing to hide, that it was he who had told the cops about the gun. Daniel asked him if he had said at the preliminary that he had gotten the gun from Richard nine months prior to his being arrested, which was clearly well before all of the assaults, except Vinco. Perez said he didn't remember. Daniel showed him a page of the hearing transcript and asked him to read it. That done, Perez said, I don't recall saying this. I couldn't say this was definite. I am... That's okay. I will ask you some questions. I'm senile. I can't remember that, okay? I don't know, he said contritely. Halpin was not happy with that answer. 
Daniel asked Perez if he had known about the reward money. Perez said he knew there was a substantial reward, but had thought the amount was a half a million dollars, not eighty thousand dollars split up among a few dozen people. Perez was contrary and uncooperative with Daniel. He often acted as though he didn't understand Daniel's questions or had not heard, forcing Daniel to repeat himself. Daniel tried unsuccessfully to get Perez to admit he'd scouted locations for different thieves to rob. Daniel said, Mr. Perez, when you were convicted in Texas of murder, what kind of weapon was used? No weapon, no weapon. What was the method? Knife, knife fight, knife. Okay, so you killed the person with a knife. We had a fight in a bar. My question was, did you use a knife to kill a person? Did I use a knife? Yes. Well, how else can I do it? I cut him, and that's all. I was drunk. On redirect, Halpin asked, Did you ever have a conversation with the defendant concerning yellow houses? Daniel objected. Judge Tynan allowed the question. He liked to burglarize them, that's all, Perez said. Did he say why? Burglarize. Burglarize them. Why? Why did he like to burglarize them? Jewelry. All right, did he say why he picked Orientals? Because they were easy. Easy to do and no retaliation, Perez testified. Thank you, Halpin said. I have no more questions. Daniel stood and pointed out that Perez had said nothing about yellow houses at the preliminary hearing. That's because nobody asked me, the witness said. Judge Tynan soon dismissed Jesse Perez. The trial moved to the capture of Richard. The first witness called by Jokelson was Manuela Villanueva. Visibly nervous about being close to Richard Ramirez, she told the court how a man tried to steal her car as she sat in it at Indiana and Whittier Boulevards, but was chased off when friends came to rescue her. Jokelson called Frank Moreno, Faustino Pignon, Angela de la Torre, her husband Manuel, and Sheriff's Deputy Andres Ramirez. They all told about their role that scalding August morning of Richard's last day on the street. Clark did what he could on cross-examination, but they each told the facts the way they knew them, and nothing he or any other defense attorney did could alter it to benefit Richard.